ability, aptitude, expertise, genius, gift. I'm the fucking talent. Hey, what's happening, Mike Schmidt? 40 year old boy podcast. It is Friday. Which, as we all know, is the normal day for podcasts to come out, correct? This is the day that everyone's decided. There was a big meeting at Podcast Central. Uh, everybody said to themselves, you know what? What's the best day for podcasts to come out? Thursday? And everybody went, fuck, Thursday. That's not happening anymore. Thursday's in the past, man. Thursday's a gone goose. Make sure your podcast comes out on Friday, because that way people get to end their week listening to it, and then they take you into the weekend. It's like you're spending the weekend with these people. Uh, and that's what all good and fine and normal podcasts do. And I, good, as you know, I want to be good and fine and normal, just like every other goddamn podcast on the planet. Or wait, let's go the other way. Remember, I didn't want to be like every other podcast. Remember that? I was like, uh, hey, keep it indie with Mike Schmidt. So maybe that's the deal. There you go. Maybe all podcasts have a set release date, and I'm... I'm punk, man. That's who I am. <laughs> yeah. Woo-hoo. I don't know why I'm snapping my punks didn't snap their fingers. They were beatniks, right? Beatniks snapped their fingers. Oh, yeah. Oh, dude. All right. Uh, maybe I'm the beatnik of podcasts or a punk. I could be a punk podcast. I can be whatever you want. But what, what kind of a punk am I? Let me ask you this. Am I more of a am I more of a poser late late scene punk like a uh, like a green day came along and tried to re uh, I don't know, reinvigorate the system? The system, the the scene. There you go, the scene. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, or am I? Am I hardcore like original? You know, I want to be the Clash. Can I be the fucking Clash of podcasts? Probably not. I'm an old fucking man. I well, then again, Joe never. He didn't let it be 51 or 52. Uh, I forgot my age there for a second. Hi, how you doing? Hi, that's what happens when you wait till Friday. But you know what? Punk podcast, man. Fuck that. I can do whatever I want. I can be whatever age I want. I'm nine, motherfuckers. How you doing? Listen to this potty mouth nine year old. Fuck no, nah, potty mouth. Who says potty mouth? What the fuck? Let's fucking hang me. Maybe I do that. That makes me more punk than anything. Kill myself on the air. Actually, I got to be honest. This is Wednesday. I'm recording this. This whole premise is false because I did kill myself. And it won't be released until somebody finds the tape. Uh, so <laughs> this is going to layer. This is the final podcast. I'm, getting, I'm building up to a crescendo. Um, but here's the thing. I'm not going to shoot myself. I know, uh, you know, for the sound, I always talked about how it was going to end with a gunshot. Um, I'm just going to eat roast chicken until I choke on a bone. And, I'm a, and 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 like dry uh, meat, uh, dude. You ever have that? You ever eat uh, take two bite, a big a bite of like chicken salad, and it doesn't have enough mayo in it or something, uh, and and you just get that like dry. Uh, it's like swallowing sandpaper. Holy fuck, that's awful. Nobody likes that when you're going ahead and fucking eating too much white meat chicken. White meat chicken is death. Go thighs, man. What's wrong with you people? Like me and Ludo Lafay have been telling you for years. Go fucking thighs, baby. Nothing wrong with putting your mouth between a couple of big ass thighs and going to work, uh, chicken or otherwise. So don't get break yourself out of the prison of white meat. You know, white meat's for Friday people, or no, for uh, for uh, other of the week people. Or no, for, no, actually, it's for Friday normies. That's what it's for. Yeah, god damn it. Like I said, all the other podcasts are putting their stuff out on Friday because that's the new rules, man. But we're 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 above that. We're beyond that. We're past that, baby. We're not we're not Friday white meat people. We're fucking whenever we want to be dark meat people. That's what we are. We fucking you know what? If I don't eat dark meat at two thirty in the fucking morning. I'm gonna do it. I want to have a chicken thigh at fucking 3 a.m. I'm going to do it. You can't fucking stop me. All you other fuckheads sitting at your tables, hands folded, eating white meat chicken dry and drinking uh, warm milk uh, at 7 o'clock p.m. at night. Fuck that, man. Just so you can get it done on time. Fuck on time. Right? Make our own rules. We go ahead and do whatever the fuck we want. Punk podcast. Yeah. Schmidt, he's calling from the London town. All right. Uh, have I convinced you yet that this is a good move? Probably. Maybe. I hope so. I hope you're thinking about it. <laughs> there was a big meeting at Podcast Central, and I said, you know what, man? I'm going to go ahead and be the punk podcast, because I, I, uh, you know why? Because I wasn't invited to the big meeting at Podcast Central. They had their own meetings without me. They said, you know what? We're going to do this without Schmitty. And I, was, I, I tried to get in. I was outside pounding on the door, screaming, Elaine! Elaine! They would not let me in. You buying any of this? I hope you're buying it. Please buy it. With, with green American money, if you will, uh, or pink Canadian money. I'll take that as well because I can find plenty of places that will take it. Do not buy this with orange Brazilian money. I, I, can't, I can't help you there. I can't, go back to your favela and go through your couches and try to find some American cash. Uh, as much as I'd love to take your Brazilian money, I don't think I can find a Portuguese turnout here. That's what we call it, a Portuguese turnout. Actually, you know what? Depending on how much money you got, you can find a Portuguese turnout in several parts of town here. Oh, nothing better than that. You wind up, wind up getting in a, you, somebody gets in your guard, you get a Portuguese turnout. Holy fuck, is that fantastic. Make sure you bring your gi. 
They grab your lapels. They get in your guard. They give you the, well, the, old, the old Portuguese turnout. My mouth is dry. I don't like a dry mouth. Hold on. Let me get a sip of water here. Uh, it, 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 this show's broke bad already. Hold on. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, oh, and speaking of the big podcast meetings, holy fuck, dudes, you know, I'm starting my mailing list. If you didn't know this, uh, well now, you know, uh, I got my, my mailing list is cranked up and it's, oh, it's not rolling yet, but I'm, I'm adding names. Uh, and we'll just, I'll, I'll touch on this later on, but, uh, you know, I talked about how MailChimp destroyed all of my contacts, which was totally fun. I lost so anywhere from like 46 to hundred to 5,000 names. So now I'm telling you this, Hey, if you want to be on my new mailing list and why wouldn't you, uh, when, when shows are coming out on a Friday, uh, you want to get me at, Hey, Mike, add me at gmail.com. You want to write me a note. Hey, Mike, add me at gmail.com. And I'll add you to the note. Like our good friend, uh, Erica Burris, who wrote me a note from the middle of uh, the desert. She lives in the desert now. Um, and she, she reached out and said, Hey, add me to your list. And I said, Hey, how's it over there? in uh, and I said a country and she goes, I'm not in that country. And I said, Oh, oh man, I, I should probably look where you're living before I ask where you're at. That's like if people write me, they're like, hey, what's going on? I'm like, I'm like, good, man. How are things on the shore of Gitchagumi? And they're like, yeah, I live in Arizona. And you're like, ah, fuck. Isn't there a Gitchagumi in Arizona? Uh, or no, how, how are things on the, sh- the shores of Ugashagahu, Gahu, Gahu, Gashagahu, Gahu, Gahu? Because I can't stop this feeling deep inside of me that I want to put you on my mailing list. Uh, don't you realize what that does to me? When you hold me and you write me then an email, everything's all right. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> um so so there you go hey I, i'll i'll tell you about it later you know as uh i mean it's all right I should, uh, i'm not gonna say this i want to but it's tempting fate but hey mike add me at gmail.com is mailchimp the mailing list and you get a note from me soon uh because i have a list i have plans i have a list i have plans you know that uh and i'll get into that a little more explicitly here in a second but um, how do I put this to you? Hmm. Hmm. Oh, geez. I'm sorry. One of my computer monitors just leaped on. It made a, it, uh, I don't like that. I don't like when things just all of a sudden just fucking light up. I, I got to, I got to calm down. I got to hide in the dark some more. I'm just getting shit that's lighting up and it fucking freaks me out. My watch makes a noise. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not for these times, man. I'm an old timey pioneer dude, man. Lock me in a fucking cabin. Let me eat fucking raw potatoes. Read something by the light of a goddamn fire. Extinguish it. Climb into bed in a nightshirt. Oh, that's what I need is a nightshirt. Be visited by three ghosts from the Christmas, whatever the fuck. They take me around. They're like, here, you're a dick. Hey, weren't you a dick? Look at what a dick you were. And then I'm like, but I want presents. And they're like, that's okay, dude. You better stop being a dick. I'm like, all right. I'm going to have a kid buy me a goose. And everything's going to be fine. Then we go check out the Cratchit family. Where's that little fucking cripple kid with the goddamn crutches hobbling around? Let me buy him a shoe and make sure everybody loves me. <laughs> That's what I want to do. Hey, goose for that kid, shoe for that kid. Look at me. I'm fucking rolling. Wait a minute. What's this? Is the punk back? I think the punk's back. Uh, <laughs> so MailChimp, in their in their haste to improve their company, ex- uh, expurgated, uh, expurgated everybody from the rolls. They took all my names away. So we're in the midst of building up the new uh, mailing list, as I've told you. Um, but then when I, I was dealing with MailChimp, and again, it's been a while, obviously. That's because they fucking whacked me from their, their company. I haven't done a mailing list thing in a fucking while. But as I go to peruse MailChimp, guess what, guess what MailChimp has done in the time that I was away? Oh, I, you'll never guess. Of course you'll guess. You'll know exactly what they did. Guess what MailChimp has done? They've, uh, well, they've gone ahead because, look, they are the world leader in having you put a bunch of email addresses in and then and then let you use their template. Like that's their whole deal. You know, they that's their mail chimp. It's right in the name there. Mail. And then there's chimps. Uh, it would be a lot more exciting if it was chimp mail. Because then who the fuck knows what'll happen? A monkey shows up, you just fucking jam something down your throat, you wake up, he tears off your eyelids. Look at that. Now you're now it's a dangerous thing. Now and it could be fun. Uh, if you, cause if you're sending mail to somebody else, don't send yourself any chimp mail, but send an enemy. Oh, see, that's the thing. They always got these new things. Now we're like, Hey, send your enemy a bag of dicks. Have you seen that? It's like a bag of dicks that are like, uh, like gummy dicks or whatever the fuck or gummy or like pasta. That's like a shaped like a dick. 
And they're like, ha ha, I got you. And I'm like, hey, he didn't get me. And just send me some food. I'll cook up this dick pasta and eat the shit out of it. I don't care. I'll, you know what? Uh, you think you got me? I'll eat dick pasta with a cream sauce. How's that fucking grab you? I don't give a shit. I'll Alfredo the fuck out of this and laugh in your face every single time. You bought me lunch. I don't give a fuck about your message. Oh, I'm mad that you're a dick. A noodle dick. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to eat all these fucking noodles and laugh at you, you fuck. Unless you're on the keto, then you're pissed. Then you're like, hey, I'll fuck with my diet here. What can you send keto? Is there like, is there like dick jerky? Like some, well, not made out of dicks, but I mean, beef jerky that's shaped like dicks. No, see, because you can make a noodle with an extruder uh, and you can make a gummy thing with a fucking mold, but beef jerky dick, you got to fucking whittle. There's no fucking corn pone idiot sitting on a porch whittling jerky dicks, is there? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> part of me, part of me hopes there is. You know, maybe that's what I can, I can aspire to. Maybe that's a company I build. Yeah, I just get a bunch of fucking hillbilly idiots with fucking corn cob pipes sitting on a goddamn porch whittling jerky dicks. Hey, you fucks, get to work. We need to fucking bag up these jerky dicks. Well, I, I've heard from the favelas. They can't get enough of our product in Brazil. Let's get that orange money and try to transition it here in the fucking states as you guys are whittling jerky dick. That's You know what? That's actually a pretty good phrase for like when you're not getting something done. You know, everybody's like, hey, man, I'm just standing with my dick in my hand. Well, we pivot from that. We go, yeah, what are you, whittling jerky dick? Get the fucking work, idiot. If I was, <laughs> that sounds like something a cool ass uh, slash terrible boss in a movie would say. Just he comes walking out saying, hey, Perkins, what are you doing? Whittling jerky dick? Get the fucking work. This ditch isn't going to dig itself. Uh, and I don't know where that job is that somebody's digging ditches. A graveyard? With the, I work in a graveyard. Is that where I work? Well, let's put it, that's where Perkins works because Perkins isn't going to do any fucking thing with his life. We all know that about Perkins. That guy's a fucking stroke. That, now, that's the kind of guy you send a bag of dicks to. Perkins is a fucking nobody. Send him a bag of noodle dicks and he'll be offended. Maybe he'll be really offended because I, I got to be honest. I would not be offended if you sent me a bag of dicks. Yeah, and, I, and now I'm going to be buried in bags of dicks. Um, but I can't eat candy dicks. That's the thing. Is that, again, if I'm whittling jerky dick, it's a different story because that's a uh, protein. But candy dicks, nah, I just don't. I'm no Perkins. Perkins cares about that kind of shit. Not me. Let Perkins dig ditches and eat candy dicks. I can't fucking make that happen on my own. I got shows to do, motherfucker, on a Friday or a Thursday or maybe even a fucking Saturday. And you know why? Because I'm the fucking Joe Strummer of podcasting, motherfuckers. Uh, that's right. Uh, the, at the end of my career and probably dead soon. Although Joe's already dead, so I guess that fucking ruins it. Damn it. Hmm. Who, I'm trying to think of a punk dude is around Henry Rollins, but he's still he's actually really podcasting. So I can't fucking make a joke around the Henry Rollins of podcasting because a he's still here and b he's fucking podcasting. Um, I'm sorry, my mouth is dry. Dudes, what the hell? Fuck, you know who doesn't have this problem? Perkins. Uh, he's he's got a throat full of grave dirt, Gra- throat full of grave dirt and 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 fucking jerky dicks. God damn it, Perkins. Go, what are you doing, whittling a jerky dick? Get a shovel. We got to put these people in the ground, you fuck. Uh, so MailChimp, again, as we know, MailChimp is the, the purveyors of online mailing lists, not to be confused with Chimp Mail, where you can send somebody a letter brought by a primate who will murder them in their sleep, which six of one is what I say, half a dozen of the other, baby. I want to hear because I'll tell you what, if, if you've lost 4,600 email list contact names, Kind of like getting murdered in your sleep by a primate who was bringing you a greeting card. I'm not going to lie. It's kind of the same feeling, I would imagine. Now, look, I've never been murdered in the night by a primate bringing me a greeting card. A primate, I'm right, right? I'm, uh, primates are, uh, monkeys are primates, chimps. Chimps are primates. Uh, I don't want to get into the semantics of the thing, but I'm pretty sure primate is correct, and I don't want to look it up because I've started talking and I'm not going to stop because I already got fucking momentum because I've already been staring at myself in a fucking mirror for God knows how long ago. What the fuck are you doing, man? But now... We're talking, and now I brought you the magic of whittling a jerky dick and whatever the fuck. Uh, <laughs> so MailChimp is, again, your your online home for mailing lists. Uh, please, again, don't get them convinced with Chimp Mail, who will send an orangutan to your house to bring you the, the penny saver, and then he will hurt you. Uh I don't know why I think that all monkeys have malice on their mind. That, is, that a, is that a thing? That can't be a real thing. Monkeys love us, don't they? They sort of look like us. Or are they mad at us? Are, you know, look, monkeys, look, they'll fuck you up. They'll tear your balls off and everything else. We know that. Don't fuck with a monkey. Don't get close to a monkey. They will grab your ball sack and your eyelid and tear them both up at the same time. You won't know what hurts first. You won't know what hurts worst. First or worst. What hurts first? What hurts worst? Um, uh, you got to think... 
at some point, and, and look, I apologize for this, but this is where my brain is going right now. I'm going to go there. I'm going to go it. You know what? You know why? Punk podcast, baby. Free flowing. Let's do this. Uh, you always hear about monkeys are tearing guys apart, right? They're, they're fucking, they're not nice. They tear your fuck. Any, anything that's fleshy and hanging, you're losing. You're losing an ear. You're losing a cheek. You're losing a ball sack. It's all coming off, man. Fucking monkeys are going to work. They're just grabbing you and just, and they're just fucking ripping you to shreds. The monkeys are like, you ever throw shit away in your closet, like old bills or stuff from years ago? Or if you get junk mail, you just try to, you just tear it up like, ah, fuck this. That's, you are monkeys junk mail. That's all you are. You're fucking monkey junk mail. They see you and they're just like, God damn it. I don't need this offer from fucking Spectrum. And they tear you to fucking pieces. Um, and I can't blame them, man. I think monkeys are killing us because they're not us. And I'm not saying they're like jealous of us, but they know that we're an evolved version to them. They're just like, these motherfuckers think they're so fun and cool with the thumbs. Now, monkeys have thumbs, right? But not like, but they only have like four fingers. Uh, are they, when, they have, when they don't have flippers. I mean, they got like, it's, they don't have long fingers like us, do they? I don't know. I think spider monkeys do. They'll grab your hand and they'll fuck around. But I'm talking like chimps and orangutans. Well, they got fucking hands and shit. That's what they grab. That's what they tear your ball sacks off with. What, what do they think they have? Like a fucking crane in, a, in one of those games at the fucking arcade? Uh, oh now, Laura, hear me out. <laughs> you wind up trapped in one of those games at the arcade, and you see a monkey walk up with like 100 bucks. You know you're losing your balls. That fucking metal crane is tearing your balls right off. Uh, but good for those monkeys for controlling themselves, not breaking into the machine. That's some civilized fucking monkeys. Maybe that's what happens at the Planet of the Apes. Maybe now it's like they tear our balls off, but eventually as we, you know, devolve and they evolve, they just wind up putting us in arcades and they, uh, cause they're like monkeys are like, we can't get our fucking paws dirty. Uh, our stinking paws dirty. We can't get our paws. You damn dirty apes. Um, so then monkeys put us in like an arcade box and then you have the metal claw and they, and they roll down and they all to and they pull your ball sack off because there's no prize for pulling off like your hand or your fucking nose or shit like that. But that's going to be a strong ass claw. But if your balls are hanging, they could tear that the fuck up. Man, your balls are in constant danger. Let's lie. Let's not lie. They're 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 just hanging on by the skin of their balls, right? When you think about it, they're just fucking dangling there, waiting for somebody to kick them or take them. Uh, constant fear of your balls being attacked. Uh, they, they, you don't know what it's like to be us ladies. I love when people say that. When the guys guys are like, ah, you know, ladies get pregnant, but I don't want to get hit in the balls. I, I used to. There's a guy named Dan Bradley, who was a stand-up comedian, who I think. Uh, checked himself out. I think he, uh, as, as you're going to hear me do at the end of this show, I think I think he sent himself some chimp mail and he let a fucking monkey tear him apart in his sleep. I think he I think he hanged himself. Is that what he did, Dan? Uh, Dan and Dan was a nice guy. I like Dan. There's nothing fucking worse than when that happens, man. When you know somebody and then they fucking check out and you're like, dude, I actually, you know, I got along with that dude. He seemed like he seemed like a good guy because again, you never know what's going on behind the scenes, folks. That's what we're told. Um. Always presume that everybody's having their worst day, so always be as nice as you possibly can be. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no cost to that. There's no cost to you being as nice as you possibly can be every single moment of every day. When you see people flash them a smile, give them that look that says, hey, you know what, man? I understand. I hope things are good for you. I want things to be good for you. And if things aren't good for you, they're going to get better for you. Uh, now, will a stranger's uh, feelings perk them up and change the way they think and keep their head out of the news? I don't know. I can't explain that. Will that keep somebody from spinning a bullet in a chamber and fucking sobbing and staring into a mirror while they click five times hoping that one of them is going to go right through their fucking temple? I can't tell you that. I can't speak to the mindset of anybody's going to kill themselves because that's never been on the table for me uh, until the end of this episode. Why am I blowing the ending? Ah, damn it. All right. I got to come clean. I don't kill myself, um, which is a shame now because you guys were all fucking. That's the only reason I've now lost every listener. That's the only reason anybody because you're all mad at me about the Friday thing. And then you're like, oh, well, he's going to kill himself. All right. Well, that sounds like penance enough. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll listen to this guy whittle a jerky dick for an hour or so. If he's going to wind up ending it with a fucking bullet festival, that'd be fantastic. I, I, I can't die in a bullet festival. Not by myself. Uh, unless I like shoot them all over my house and hope they ricochet off and kill me. I'd have to be in like a big ass fucking wok, like a big giant frying pan or like, you know what? I figure if you went to fucking Chicago and you went to the, see the bean, you know what the bean is? Uh, no, not Patty Bean, who I played in basketball when I was a youth. No, the bean is a sculpture um, that it's funny because now people are like, hey, what do you know about Chicago? People are like, ah, the bean. And I'm like, dude, I fucking left before the bean showed up. I'm sorry to know that the bean is now the memory that people have of Chicago, like Navy Pier. And, uh, you know, the Sears Tower, whatever the fuck. There was a bunch of stuff. But but now, The Bean, which is fine, I suppose, for everybody. Uh, but to me, like, if you went to The Bean, The Bean would be convenient because you could shoot The Bean. And, uh, by the way, 
<laughs> By the way, that's that's the female equivalent of whittling jerky dick. Uh, what are you doing? Ah, I'm just shooting the bean. Really? You fucking bean shooter? Why don't you fucking whittle a jerky dick and get back to work, you fuck? Um, if you went to the bean, because you can see a reflection in it, it's like a big ass fucking, it's a kidney. It's a big fucking kidney in the middle of the fucking park. And, uh, but if you shot that fucking thing with an assault rifle, I'll bet the bullets would ricochet right back at you. And there's your bullet festival. You die in a hail of your own shot bullets because you could never, let's face it. And I'm, I'm very comfortable in saying this as a person and as a military man, you could never die in a hail of your own bullets. Never. You could never kill yourself with a hail of bullets. You want to. I mean, unless, I mean, unless you shot them all up in the air and they all landed on your fucking skull, I guess that's the true meaning of a hail of bullets. But you always hear like hail of gunfire. Well, you could never kill yourself in a hail of gunfire unless you like shot a hail of gunfire at a bunch of angry people and then they charge you. Better yet, shoot a shoot. A, <laughs> you know where I'm going with this, right? Shoot a hail of gunfire at a, at a huge gathering of chimps. And but not at them, like up in the air over their head, and then like and then they're gonna be like <laughs> and they're gonna come over and fucking tear you apart. Um you know what I would do if I was gonna if I was gonna commit suicide by chimp, I would wear fucking like uh combination lock underwear or something. Like I'd, I'd wear not a cup, because they're gonna find they're gonna see right through a cup, but I would try to invent a device that protected my balls at all costs. So like if they tore me apart, the only thing that would be left would be my balls. You know, because you hear that all the time. They're like, oh, man, he tore his cheek off and his eyelids and his fucking ears, his fingers. And they tore his fucking balls and cock off. It was brutal. This guy was fucking decimated. Well, they always go for the balls. They're fucking monkeys. It's as high as they can fucking reach. Orangutan, I mean, he, he can pull your nipples off, I guess. But, I mean, the fucking monkeys are low riders. So they fucking run up and they're going to fucking work your fucking ball bag like a speed bag. And then and then that's their first go-to because then you're like, oh, my balls. And then they tear you to fucking shreds and leave you like a jigsaw puzzle with a couple of pieces gone. Um, but what I do, hear me out. Here's what I do. If I'm going to antagonize a bunch of monkeys, if I'm going to shoot a fucking assault rifle at a goddamn bunch of monkeys, if I commit suicide by chimp, before I do it, I lock my balls up in a in a contraption. I, it helped me. Somebody helped me figure out how to make a contraption. I'm not, look, I'm not an inventor. I'm not a creative sort. I can't sit down with a schematic and build you a fucking ball bag that protects you from chimps. Uh, but I would do it just, to, you know, what, because I wanted to die that much sooner at the hands of the chimp because I'm committing suicide by a chimp. I've clearly decided I want to die at the hands of these chimps. So if I fire a gun at them and they come charging at me and they find out my balls aren't for sale, my balls aren't for, aren't for purchase, my balls have, have been uh, protected beyond all reasonable doubt, then they're going to go for the rest of me and they're going to go in a fury, a frenzy, a flesh-tearing frenzy by these chimps. They're going to leave me in a fucking pile of skin tags all over the goddamn park. Just the fucking bean has dents in it. Chimps are tearing me apart. Chicago police won't get involved because fuck them. They're lazy fuckers. They're not really. I don't know anything about them. But I'll tell you what, if I was a cop and I saw a fucking pile of chimps just fucking a dude up after he shot the bean, <laughs> oh, no, sir. I let the chimps finish their business and I call fucking Dr. Lester Fisher to show up from Lincoln Park Zoo and rouse these chimps and throw them back in their cages. I wonder how the fuck they all got to the bean. Let me ask you this. If you're taking fucking monkeys on a field trip, don't take them to a tourist spot where a bunch of tourists are going to be, especially when you know it's the day a guy's going to come and try to kill himself with a hail of his own bullets. I guess that guy wouldn't advertise that, though. Maybe on Facebook. Maybe he's got a manifesto. Hey, today's the day I go to the bean and I shoot it and so I can die with a hail of my own bullets. And Dr. Lester Fisher's like, all right, put the monkeys on the bus. We got sights to see. <laughs> Let's fucking roll, baby. <laughs> with green alligators and long neck geese. Some humpy back camels and some chimpanzees, some cats and rats and elephants. And sure as you're born, you're never going to see no unicorn, but you are going to see a pack of fucking ravenous chimps tear apart a guy with an assault rifle. Wouldn't you rather see that? Fuck green alligators and long neck geese. I want to see a gang of chimps just fucking maul a dude with an assault rifle. That's a goddamn Wednesday in my world. Fuck that. Fuck the bean. Just fucking have a pile of monkeys just rampage a dude and just and just roll themselves. I want these monkeys to fucking I want them to be like goddamn weird Voltron monkeys who assemble in the fucking shape of that wagon wheel from fucking Pirates of the Caribbean. And they just chase everybody and run them the fuck down with a, 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 par partially some monkeys just leap off and other monkeys replace them like they could roll super fast. And then as they get closer to a person, one monkey leaps off to take that person out and another monkey leaps to take his place. The structure never greater than the fucking hole. Oh, monkeys. I would train these monkeys to murder everybody. I would be the Willard of monkeys. 
But that's, see, but that you could never have as many rats. Like Willard has, let me ask you this. All right, Willard's got all of his rats. And I've got, eh, how many killer monkeys could I possibly have at one time? Let's go 15. Nah, that seems high. I can't fucking buy that many bananas. Fuck. Um, I, I, I guess I'll go. You know what? Fuck it. I, I'll take five killer monkeys. I don't need a fucking whole. This is the thing. I don't need a fucking bloated amount of monkeys who claim to be killers. I just want some fucking surgical motherfuckers. That's what I want. I want some monkey murderers. Who are, I, and I just need a handful. So give me five. Give me five of your best murder monkeys and I'll fuck up Willard and his rats. I don't give a fuck. He's got a billion rats coming at me in waves. These fucking monkeys will destroy him. Fuck you rats with your fangs and your bullshit. Go back to the sewer. Go back to Willard's house. These monkeys are going to stomp you the fuck out. And I'll stand behind them with a goddamn, like a South African army uniform on and just laugh. <laughs> I have no idea why. Look, I'm going to be honest with you. I have no idea why Colonel De Beers popped into my head right then, but he did. He was a pro wrestler from when I was a kid. And he was this big barrel chested dude with a fucking like, um, not a handlebar mustache, but one of those mustaches that grows. Uh, he looked like Colonel McBrag. You know, those fucking mustaches that grow over your cheek and up under your ear. Does that make sense? Like, it, it just, it's uh, it's not a Van Dyke's. The Van Dyke's a chin strap thing. Just a big fucking, like, walrus, kind of a handlebar mustache, but not curly cute. Not Raleigh Fingers. It was, no, it was big, bushy, and it went from under his nose all the way back to his ears. And he would pull it, like, he'd pull it and, like, twist it. You know that, you know how people do that dumb shit. And he would show up in, like, a fucking, he was, a, supposedly, he was a South, South African, brace yourselves. He was a South African, uh, military colonel. I don't know what branch, but he came to the States because he was, he was kicked out for being too ruthless. <laughs> and then of course he wound up venturing to Minnesota to join the American wrestling association. Why would he, why would he be form a black, a black ops security crew? Not unlike Blackwater. He should do something like that with all of his military contacts. You would imagine he would have all sorts of things that he can put to fill his time with. He could find some way to have some sort of mercenary outfit and go ahead and make money all over the world, dabbling in all sorts of politics and mercenary work. But no, no Colonel De Beers who was uh, a very well-respected colonel in one arm of the, of the South African military, of course, during apartheid. So he wasn't that well-respected. He was, he was a hated and reviled man who was, who was very cruel to his subjects. Uh, do you have subjects of your colonel in the army? What are the fuck? He, he committed atrocities heretofore unknown in the South African city of Johannesburg. And so they decided, you know what? We love this guy. He's a whip cracker of the first order, but we, uh, this is bad publicity for us and for the country. So this is far too, uh, I would say angry a man to have in this uniform. So we need to drum him out. So they told him, you're out. You're out of the South African Accord, Colonel De Beers. And he said, fantastic. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go throw Sergeant Slaughter in a full Nelson, you fucks. You'll miss me when I'm gone. And he boarded the next plane out of Johannesburg with his fucking military garb and all of his fucking flair. And then he fucking just goose stepped into the fucking AWA's headquarters and saw Vern Gagne there. And he said, "Uh -huh, please give me Jimmy Snuka on a platter. And they did. That's the craziest thing. Colonel De Beers shows up, drummed out of the South African fucking military because he's too violent. And you sign him up to become a professional wrestler. Why wouldn't you report the authorities that this man was on American soil? Why wouldn't you do something where you found up getting yourself out from under the boot heel of Colonel De Beers? Why would you ever agree to give him compensation in physical combat exercises that you put on for children in casinos? That doesn't make a lot of sense. And yet here we are. Well, the Ganyas were desperate. The fucking McMahon family was going ahead and gobbling up territories here and there. And the AWA was just trying to keep up. So if a fucking former South African military man comes in and says, hey, I, I have a black heart and I will crush whoever's in my way. Well, you don't think to yourself, well, we better call the authorities on this weirdo. You go, well, <laughs> when can you start? When can you start battling earthquake Ferris in jobber matches on my on my ESPN television? We've got plenty of fucking TV time to fill. Um, but for some reason, when I thought of an army of monkeys that I would send to battle, I thought of Colonel De Beers behind them holding his riding crop and stroking his mustache. Uh, he popped into my brain. I, I look, I don't understand the, the merits of a Colonel De Beers. I'll tell you what, this is totally true. Like usually I can see a dude and I can tell you who he was before. Like if there's a, if there's a dude who's a wrestler, like, um, there was a, a okay. There was a wrestler named the repo man in WWF when I was a kid. 
again, wrestling, incredibly stupid. It's still to this day, partially stupid. But back then, incredibly stupid. And there was a dude named the Repo Man. And he literally would like, he played this weird music, which uh, his, his, go find his theme because it's pretty funny. And then he would sneak to the ring wearing one of those like Robin Hood bandit masks and a, and a big duster coat. And he would carry a rope, like a rope or a chain, because he was going to repossess your car while you were in the ring, but he was going to fight you first. I, I couldn't, there's no way to define it. There's just no way. I don't know what kind of creative meeting decided that this, the, that the repo man was a good idea. Maybe the same people who hung Lanny Poffo with the, with the fucking genius poet laureate of the WWF tag and had him read a shitty poem before every fight. Uh, cause again, you have to understand wrestling. People think they're making television. They don't think because in the old days, again, it was fucking, you're, if you're doing wrestling, you, you, you've got Colonel the beers and his monkey army taking on fucking Sergeant slaughter in a fucking tent somewhere, which is fine. That's what wrestling used to be. But then McMahon made a TV and made it all. And they fucking hoarded it out to where it was all these fucking characters there. Look, there is a guy and I can't even imagine. Look, it was the final. You went and took a paycheck from McMahon. You had to, because everything else was falling the fuck apart. There was a tag team in the AWA. Their name was the long ride. And it was Bill Irwin and uh, was it his brother? I think it was the Irwin brothers, but they went as the Long Riders. And they were their whole gimmick was they were basically like Hell's Angels. They wore fucking denim in the ring. They wore vests. They fucked guys up. They had really long fucking hair. And that was their deal, man. They were the fucking they were and they were built as being one of those old school tough guy tag teams, which in the, you, you can't like there's guys that were really tough when I was a kid. That were you know they were sold to you as tough. In the NWA, there was a guy named Dirty Dick Murdoch, and he was just a dude with a fucking giant plug of chewing tobacco in his mouth, and he was just a fucking redneck hillbilly. That's all he was. And he'd go to the ring, and he would you know he looked like he was just that big fucking. He had a dad body before dad bodies were called dad bodies when he used to just call him fat. I mean, this dude was just like a fucking barrel chested. You ever see a guy who's barrel chested? Okay, and then it tapers off. Just imagine this dude looked like he was standing in a barrel. And also, here was the gross look. And I, this has always been a thing for me. And I, I, I know this will sound crazy because I've been a wrestling fan forever. Like if a muscle dude fucking waxes, you know, his chest, his fucking underarms, all that shit, whatever the fuck, makes sense. Rick Rude, you want to see every nook and cranny on that English muffin fucking stomach. You want to see every fucking thing that guy's bringing to the goddamn table. Lex Luger, the Road Warriors, these are fucking big monsters. And, uh, and, and that was why I liked Animal better than Hawk, though. I'm sure you know what I'm getting at here. Hawk, you know, waxed within an inch of his life. Rick Rude, all these fucking muscle dudes. That was fine with me. Hulk Hogan, I, I, was, that's, I, I got it. But if you weren't a muscle dude and you fucking waxed everything and you had no hair, you just, you just looked creepy. You just looked smooth and it was gross. Dick Murdoch just looked like a giant baby. And that's not even a fucking lie. Like, I'm not, I'm not even joking. If you went and looked at him, he looks like a giant barrel sized baby. Even his face, even his face was like kind of weirdly baby Huey ish almost or baby Herman from fucking uh, uh, Roger Rabbit. He just, he just looked like a fucking dopey hillbilly. It's and, and that's what Dick Murdoch's whole gimmick was. He was like. He was in a tag team once with Dirty Dick Slater. Literally, it was Dirty Dick Slater and Dirty Dick Murdoch. And I think, believe it or not, they were called the Rebels. And they came in with the Confederate flag and all that bullshit back when that was still acceptable to do. Um, but they were hard. That was that was a style of wrestler, the hardcore tough guy who would just stomp a hole in you. No gimmick, no face paint, just a fucking guy who liked to fight. And that's what Dick Murdoch was. That's what Roddy Piper was. Um, but Roddy Piper was a fucking level above because also Roddy Piper was just... He was magical. The guy's the fucking, he's a magician. I just saw a fucking, what, did, what promo did I just see? Some promo he did in the back. I'll tell you what, I will say this too, Roddy Piper, uh, unfortunately, borderline racist a lot of the time, which is a drag because he was, uh, he was a huge influence to me as a kid. Uh, but then I, I watch him now and I cr you cringe. You just have to because look, wrestling was a different era. We just had, dude, there's a wrestling, there's a bunch of wrestling. Right now is a good time for wrestling. It's funny, and it's funny, I talk about characters in wrestling. There's a fucking guy, uh, he because uh, I mentioned Colonel Beard. I don't even know how I got into this fucking thing. Um, well, because you know, because I was saying the AWA needed characters to compete with. Me. Oh, the Repo Man! I didn't even get to fucking finish that. All right, so let me finish that thought. So the Repo Man, he's a dude. He shows up and he's like sneaking around and he fucking beats you in your match and then he, I don't know, he tows you out of the ring, whatever the fuck. But that's when he's into WWE, WWF. But before that, like what I was saying is, I can tell you when guys are somebody else. Okay, so he's the repo man in WWF, but when he wasn't in WWF, he was 
in NWA as Crusher Khrushchev. He was one of the Russian family. Uh, Ivan and Nikita Koloff, along with Crusher Khrushchev, they were like the world six-man tag team champions and stuff. Uh, his real name is Barry Darsow. He worked with the Road Warriors at a fucking bar in Minneapolis. That was the thing. They were all bouncers. Rick Rude, Barry Darsow, and then Mike Hegstrand and Joe Laurinaitis, which, who are the Road Warriors. So they all worked together, and they wound up fucking meeting Ole Anderson. And he's like, you guys should all get in to be wrestlers. But my point is, I'm getting fucking way ahead of myself. But fucking... Um, I, the repo man, you saw him and they're like, Oh my God, who's the repo man? Cause there were a bunch of WWF fans who didn't pay attention to other wrestling, but I'd be like, why the fuck is Crusher Khrushchev the repo man? Why can't he just be Crusher Khrushchev? Well, it's because other people own these gimmicks. So they couldn't take their gimmicks and go anywhere. But I always knew you'd see a guy. So like I was talking about the long riders, Bill Irwin, wild Bill Irwin was one of the long riders. And they were this real tough guy tag team, wore denim cow and fucking biker boots. And they just stomped fucking guys the fuck out. Again, they didn't look like wrestlers. They just like guys who could fight. Uh, they just looked like Hell's Angels. That's what they were sold as. But then the WWF gets Bill Irwin, and they're just like, ah, oh, tough guy in denim? No, we got to pass up on that. Here's who you're going to be. And Bill Irwin becomes, oh, brace yourselves, folks, the goon. And he comes to the ring in a hockey outfit with a hockey stick, and he wears wrestling boots that look like skates, and... uh and he does all the same shit he did when he was Wild Bill Irwin of the Long Riders, but now he does it under the guise of a hockey player who is so tough he was kicked out of the NHL. But they never say his name, so you can't do the research on it. See, WWF was way ahead of you because if you were like, "Well, what team did he play for?" They'd be like, "Well, he was he played in certain teams," and they'd go, "Well, what's his real name?" And they go, "Ah, he, he can't use it anymore. He's the goon." And. uh that was when I started to check out. You know what I mean? It was like I, that's why I gravitated to the NWA and the AWA because they had actual. But then the AWA brought in Colonel DeBeers and like, oh, what the fuck's happening here? <laughs> Man, I have a dry mouth this entire fucking show, and I apologize for that, dude. This is weird. Like as I'm talking, all right, my computer's making weird blinking things. I hope it's not. Uh, what the fuck? Who knows? I, oh Christ! It took me two days to start this fucking show. The last thing I need is for it to bottom the fuck out. Um. But let's pre- let's proceed. Let's take our chance and make sure that it doesn't fry out. Should we do that? Yes, let's. Let's go ahead. I'll tell you, if you hear me, if you hear me at any point go, God damn it, you're going to know what the fuck happened. All right. Um, so um, I, I don't know even get. Oh, so that's the thing is, uh, you know, Barry, by Wild Bill Irwin and fucking Christian Khrushchev. Dusty Rhodes was a fucking, you know, he was basically a, a, a evangelical preacher who fought like he was just a fucking tough guy, weird. I can't even explain what Dusty Rhodes was to you. He was just, go go look up the Hard Times promo. You'll know exactly who Dusty Rhodes was. He was the common man. That's who he was. He represented the common man. He'd fight against Rick, he'd fight against Ric Flair and all the fucking rich guys. But then, Vince McMahon, this is the thing he loved doing. Was uh, you know Dusty Rhodes was a huge star in the NWA, like a gigantic star. So then when he signs with Vince McMahon, Vince McMahon makes him a plumber, son of a plumber. And uh, he makes him carry a plunger and come to the ring and fight like that. And uh, I remember when I first saw it happen, I was like, I was so sad for Dusty Rhodes. And like, I know he's getting a paycheck and whatever the fuck. And it's all a grift anyway, especially back then. But they all had to eventually go work for McMahon. And when they went to work for McMahon, he fucking, f- he just ruined their gimmick. The The Road Warriors had that happen to them. The Road Warriors were fucking murderers. That's That was their whole gimmick. They played Black Sabbath, Iron Man. They came to the ring and they fucked everybody up. In the AWA, in the NWA, in these fucking matches overseas, in Japan, they were revered. And there's to this day, to this day, if the roof blows off an arena when somebody comes in or whatever, they or, or does something, they call it a Road Warrior pop. The Road Warriors changed the business because they were so ridiculously over. They couldn't keep them as bad guys. They would be bad guys. And people would cheer for them anyway. So they're like, well, we're not getting any mileage. So they would make them good guys. And then I would be furious because I loved them better when they were fucking bad guys. But the good thing about them was when they were bad guys or they were good guys, they kind of acted the same. They were still just fucking murderers and dicks to everybody. But the problem was they would team them with all these other good guys. So like you'd, in the in the NWA, they'd come to town and they were going to fight. You know, th- this is when they turned them because they were feuding in the NWA with the fucking Freebirds. Then they go to the NWA and they they start feuding with the Russians. So then they're like, Fans are chanting USA for the Road Warriors. It's like, nah, 
The Road Warriors are murderers from like fucking the streets of Chicago. They're not, they don't give a fuck because they would do that. The only good thing was in their promos, they'd pretend they'd be like, "Hey man, we just want to fucking fight the Russians. Like we're not we're not fucking patriots, you know." But then they but then eventually they started to bleed over to talk about America and what it means. You can't disrespect our country, and now you're just like, "Ah oh, man, you guys aren't this." Just fucking because that was their whole gimmick was that fuck it, we'll just kick it, the fuck out of anybody anytime. That's fine. So then they wind up in uh, in in WWF, and he doesn't fuck with their gimmick. All he does is he makes it more over the top so that he can sell toys. So he puts them in these like spiked shoulder pads. He puts them in these wild fucking colors. Uh, but they're still marketed as the Road Warriors and they still act like the Road Warriors, which is fine. It's fucking, that's great. But but it's so funny because that's the era so many people remember them from is these big fucking spiked shoulder pads and this over the top fucking outfits. But when they were just fucking lean with fucking biker boots and fucking just, and just black fucking like pants and they'd come in and fuck dudes up, dude, dude. They were vicious and evil, and it was fun to watch. And I still was a fan of them in the WWF, but I didn't want them to be good guys. But they team with like idiots like the Ultimate Warrior. And then, because then when you're the good guys, you have to get beat up. That's the thing. As bad guys, they would just fuck dudes up. And it was like, yeah, that's exactly it. But then as good guys, they'd get left laying, whether it was an animal got his eye socket broken and during a weightlifting concert with the contest with the warlord and the barbarian. <laughs> I'm mad. I'm chilly. I wanted to say that as fast as possible because it's such a ludicrous premise. Yes. Animal and Hawk were in a weightlifting because Animal had just set the uh, supposedly the world bench press record and the warlord from the powers of pain said, well, I can lift more than you. So they set up a weight bench and uh, as Animal went to go and uh, and lift, they fucking smashed him in the head and uh, and they fractured his eye socket. But the only cool thing is the end. The Road Warriors were too cool because then he has the fractured eye socket. Supposedly could have been a work. Maybe. I don't know. I don't want to fool you guys. Kayfabe. Uh, but then he starts wearing a fucking like a Jason hockey mask to fight in and he looks even tougher. It's like, Oh my God. As if, as if you couldn't make the road warriors any more cool, then he's got to wear this fucking evil mask to wrestle in. You're like, Oh, it's gorgeous. Uh, so, so they, you know, that's the thing is when they were good guys, they had to take a beating and I never wanted them to take a beating there. I, I, this is totally true. One of my, my most happy days in wrestling. The Road Warriors were good guys. They were good guys. They were teaming with the fucking Dusty Rhodes and the Magnum TA and all these dudes. They even made Nikita Koloff a good guy because he was a Russian dude. Whatever the fuck. I, I don't know. But then one day, the Road Warriors fucking turned. They'd been good guys for, for like, I think two years in the NWA. And then they turned and they attacked Dusty Rhodes in a parking lot. They put one of the spikes from their shoulder pads in his fucking eye. They like they fucking tried to pop his eye out, and they, they you know, there was pictures of him with blood and a fucking. And they left him laying in a parking lot, and then they were vicious and mean, and the fans hated him again. And I was like, yeah, see, this is who the fucking road warriors are, man. They should be vicious and mean. Uh, I don't even know why I'm doing this. So the road warriors were always the road warriors wherever they went. They never got their gimmick fucked with, but other guys would show up in a WF, and they would just make them. He made. There was a wrestler named the One Man Gang. I've talked about him on here many times. Have I many times? That seems high. Uh, the one man gang was he he wrestled as the one man gang. He had a fucking tattoo on the side of his head, a mohawk. He was probably like six, 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 seven. He weighed 400 pounds. He was just a monster. And then he comes to the fucking WWF and they made him into uh, he was the one man gang for a while. But then he got managed by a, re- a very racist caricature manager named Slick, who converted Akeem to uh, a cur- a cur- a cur- converted him to being, I guess, a Muslim, but I don't think they ever really stated it. All they did was they had him try to act black and he dressed completely different and he wore like a fez and his name was Akeem, Akeem the Dream, and he would dance in the ring because that's, I don't know if you know this, that's what black people do all the time. They dance. They're very musical people, according to the McMahons. Uh, So... I don't even know how I got off on this fucking tangent, but that's the point. Whenever you're, whenever you were a wrestler, they would fight. Oh, so here's all right. So this is the bottom line of the whole fucking thing. Thank you, brain. Uh, like I knew Akeem was the one man gang. I knew Dusty Rhodes was, you know, Dusty Rhodes. I knew that the Repo Man had been Crusher Khrushchev. Like you would see, guys. I knew the Goon had been Bill Irwin. I knew that the 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 Red Rooster was Terry Taylor. They would change when they'd come to WF, and I'd be like, oh man, what a bummer. But Colonel De Beers. I I don't I got no fucking idea who that dude was. That was a dude who just showed up out of nowhere as Colonel De Beers, and I never saw him be anybody else. I never saw him. And look, I lost touch with wrestling for a while. Maybe he became maybe he got promoted. Maybe he was Major De Beers. I got no fucking idea. I don't know anything about ranks. Is Major ahead of Colonel? I have no clue. No, it isn't because Major Burns was beneath Colonel Potter. 
So yeah, colonel is a good way to go. Uh, lieutenant colonel, maybe lieutenant. No, lieutenant colonel's got to be lower than a regular colonel, right? I don't fucking know. But now you're gonna th- now you think of Colonel Potter fighting in a fucking wrestling match. Um, so I I don't I can't. Colonel Beers was a mystery to me because he just showed up. So there, what I guess what I'm saying to you is that there is a good possibility he truthfully was, uh, he truly was in the in the South African military, and then he came here to wrestle. That could be the case because he wasn't a guy I recognized from anywhere, and I never saw him wrestle anywhere else as Colonel as anything but Colonel Beers. He was always Colonel Beers for me, his whole career. But it's not like I fucking kept up on the guy. Like I, I'm, I've been whittling jerky dick for a long time. I haven't been fucking able to pay attention to the comings and goings of a Colonel Beers. Damn you! How dare you hold me to a weird standard? Um. Not sure how we sp- oh we spun off in that because we'd have Colonel Beers behind stroking his mustache behind our army of chimps, our army of murderous chimps. Uh, which again, by the way, I would take five chimps and I would still fuck up Willard's rats. Did we cover that? I think we did. I, I love saying that we would cover that like I have it written down somewhere. Like I was like, hold on, let me take a look at this. All right, scrolling down. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I would have five chimps in my rat murdering army. Yeah, if I wanted to have a an army of murdering chimps to take out rats, I would only have five. I only need five. I only need five of you motherfuckers. I don't need a hundred fucking chimps because I'll tell you what, you give me a hundred chimps and I'm, I'm guaranteeing this. Nothing against chimps, all right? But I'm going to say at least 80 of those motherfuckers because I can't keep an eye on them. I'm going to be lazy, eating bananas, doing all sorts of dumb chimp shit, throwing shit at one another and not fucking focusing on the task at hand. You just give me five evil, murderous fucking chimps and I will rule the goddamn world. That's all I need. I just need five good chimps. <laughs> Give me five good chimps and I will fucking, I will rule this land, damn it. Don't think I won't. You can't have a part of me. Give me five good chimps. And all those chimps. Uh, All right. So I don't know what we were talking about. Fucking murdering chimps. Shooting yourself at the bean. Here's the deal, folks. You know, it's Friday. And uh, and I pushed myself around a little bit this week. Where I'm like, I don't have a show. And already, I look at my, I look at the clock now. We're we're three quarters of an hour into a show. I don't even even done anything yet. I haven't even talked about anything uh, that there is to talk about. Not that there is anything to talk about, but you know what I'm saying. We got murdering chimps and fucking rat armies. Uh, and it, you know what's funny? Look like at my brain. Part of me thinks that I've talked about murderous chimps and rat armies before. <laughs> is that what someplace I always end up? Do I always end up with murderous chimps taking on a rat army? Uh, I, I I don't know. Maybe that's just, you know what? Maybe that's the fatal flaw in this show. Or or is that just like the fucking, that, is that the ground zero of this show forever? Look, we're always going to start off uh, on, a, on a patch of land that features murderous chimp armies taking on a rat army. That's it. Murderous chimps, not even a, an army. I need five guys. You know why? Because it's like, it's like in, in fucking Gangs of New York when he shows you the five points and he closes them because when I close them, it's a fist. And that's right. I give, give me five five murderous monkeys, and I'll just call that a primate fist. You can't handle me. Y'all you know, fucking ooh ooh your ah ah. You're gonna fucking take me out. Uh, that seems that's why why did my brain go there? That seems markedly similar to I'm gonna eep op your orc ah ah. Damn it. My brain works in like mysterious ways, but then also it's got stuff tucked in there from before. A lot of crevices in my brain. My brain looks a lot like Rick Rude's stomach. Um. So why don't you sit back and let all and you all you ugly sweaty uh, podcast listening head head uh, sweat hogs sit back and listen to what a real man podcasts like. Hit the music. Um, that's something Rick Rude did in the ring all the time. Although he didn't podcast. Charlie don't podcast. Neither does Rick Rude. Because uh, Rick Rude is dead, like all the cool wrestlers from back then. Although Animal's still alive, but Animal keeps kayfabe, which is a little weird. You don't care. Nobody cares. But I talk about those weird characters like fucking Colonel the Beers, who again he, he drummed out of the South African Army and he came right to the AWA and they signed him. There's a guy wrestling now, and I'm like, I don't. And, and look, there's a million weirdos wrestling. All right, there's a million. But I don't know why this guy struck me because this is what because you know why because his move is pathetic. This is a pathetic thing to do, in my opinion. Hear me out. Uh, there's a wrestling organization now called AEW, which is totally fun. Chris Jericho's in it. Kenny Omega's in it, the Young Bucks, Cody Rhodes, Private Party, Best Friends, the Young Bucks, who I mentioned already twice now. Uh, And they're an upstart company funded by a billionaire named Tony Khan, whose dad owns the Jacksonville Jaguars and I think like two Premier League teams. He's fucking loaded. So the kid's like, I got all this money. Let's fucking team up with these wrestlers and try to take on Vince McMahon and his 80-year-old self. 
So they've got a, a new wrestling company and uh, with a guy named MJF, who's one of the hottest talents in the business, whatever the fuck, all these different guys. And it's fun. I went, this is, I went to their card in Chicago with Ahmad. When Ahmad and I went to wrestling, we went to see AEW, and it was fucking fantastic. It was totally fun. So when we were there, there was a wrestler, and uh, there, there was a three-way match called a Cracker Barrel Death Match, if I remember correctly, or just a Cracker Barrel, whatever the fuck. And here's my favorite thing. Like, the, the fucking restaurant Cracker Barrel, liter- they literally sponsored it. Like, there was a, there was a, a pile of breakfast that got involved, like somebody threw somebody into a thing of biscuits and gravy. There was a fucking, you know, there was an actual Cracker Barrel barrel with the, with the logo on it. It was insane. But it was, uh, like, it's fine if, it, if it, you know, because it totally makes sense. Cracker Barrel, Waffle House Wrestling, Deep South, whatever the fuck, uh, Hillbillies. It makes sense. But they sponsored this company and they sponsored this particular match. And it was like a Cracker Barrel death match or a House of Horrors match or something like that. And the three wrestlers in it, there was a guy named Joey Janela, who is, he is constantly in matches where he's getting, here he bleeds. That's his whole hook is he winds up in these fucking weird ass matches where there's thumbtacks and, uh, and all sorts of crazy garbage. So it was, it was Joey Janela. It was a three-way death match between Joey Janela, uh, a guy named Jimmy Havoc, uh, who's going to wreak all sorts of it in the ring. And then the guy I'm about to bring, a guy I'm going to talk to you about is a guy named Darby Allen. Uh, now, I this match was, I was like, well, this is going to be a garbage match. You know what I mean? We're there because I was there to see Kenny Omega, see a lot of guys who could work really well in the ring and have fun. But you need a little bit of everything at the wrestling match. It's like when they, you know, they can't have fucking midget matches anymore. They used to have them a million times because they'd be like, all right, got to have the chick match, got to have the midget match, got to have all this stuff happen. Uh, got to have uh, a politically correct there guy to go ahead and make sure they don't call it a chick or a midget match. Probably <laughs> go ahead and change the name, please. Uh, have a little people and a lady match. That's fine. Well, don't have a little people fight a lady match. That's not good. And never the twain shall meet. You can't have that. Don't have a little person fight a lady. That's no good. That's no bueno. They can team up and clear the ring if you want. Um, but if you ever have a mixed tag match, don't have the lady fight the midget. Uh, so anyway, so this three-way match, I'm like, I'm, it comes in the middle of the fucking card and I'm like, all right, well, this, we'll see what the fuck happens here. And it turns out to be the most fun fucking thing I'd, I saw all night. It was, it was so fucking crazy and great other than the young bucks against Phoenix and, uh, some other masked luchador dude in a fucking, uh, who was it? Phoenix and Pentagon junior. I think his name was. Uh, they fought the Young Bucks in a ladder match, like a ladder and table match, where dudes are just falling from great heights and smashing through multiple furniture uh, pieces. Oh, it was insane. That was a fuck. That match was fucking, it tore the house down. It was crazy. However, I had very little, exp- I mean, I had high expectations for that match, and it met them. I had very little expectations for Joey Janela and his and thumbtacks in his eyes and Jimmy Havoc. Who, who does all sorts of murder stuff as well, and then Darby Allen. And if you haven't guessed by now, yes, uh, Darby Allen is a tribute to Darby Crash and Gigi Allen, I believe, uh, because he comes out and he's got face makeup on. He rides a skateboard to the ring, but it's but it's okay. He's not, because uh, I know you're thinking pro wrestler. <laughs> he's like some six foot eight behemoth who's riding a skateboard. Like, what's up, fellow kids? No, he's not that fucking dude. Uh, Darby Allen looks like a dude you'd be standing in line next to at Subway. Uh, better yet, he looks like a guy who'd been on the other side. He'd be the sandwich artist making your sandwich at Subway. And he would be all scrubbed up and looking normal, but his sleeve would be pulled up and it would betray like a fucking total arm sleeve of tattoos. And you'd be like, uh, this guy probably has another life outside of here that I don't want to know about. And that's totally true. So Darby Allen's like a fucking weird murder wrestler just like the other guys so i figured they'd have whatever the fuck they just they'd go ahead and jump off shit and everything would be fine but it was it turned out to be the fucking craziest most fun match all i mean just a t- i mean i was on my feet yelling and just going oh because they would do the dumbest shit that's the whole thing it's dumb these matches are fucking stupid then sometimes all these matches with like light bulbs and thumbtacks and barbed wire and you're just like what the fuck are these guys doing and i've seen a bunch of garbage wrestling there was a wrestling company called xpw here in la and i used to go see that there was a guy whose name was jimmy the homeless guy not even a joke came to a ring with a, a fucking shopping cart and i saw in one match they put the shopping cart on the top rope and put jimmy in it and pushed him off to the floor and he just fucking crashed down, and he thought he, hurt, he thought he broke his fucking head. I mean, it was insane. There was a dude named Vic Grimes. There was all sorts. Of, there was a guy named Supreme. He was the king of the death match. We saw fucking barbed wire and light tubes and thumbtacks and razors and and just blood and and I, let me tell you something. 
you get a real high quality of spectator at those shows. Oh, do you ever? Oh, those people. You know what? They're just there for a Sunday afternoon of fun. They just want to see a, a nice athletic sporting contest and a couple of fellas have at one another. No, these fucking bloodthirsty motherfuckers are screaming for guys to die. And I'm trying to watch it just like I'm trying to make heads or tails of it where I'm like, all right, at least I'm, I'm kind of in the room when this happens. But also, do I really want to be in the room where it happens? I don't think I want to. This is this is a case where I do not want to be in the room where it happens because homeless Jimmy is getting thrown off the fucking girders by New Jack. And I mean, there's a legit chance somebody could fucking wind up seriously injured. And also, XPW is owned by a porn dude named Rob Black. So we would have all of his porn actresses come out like Christy Mist and stuff. And eventually you'd just get a nipple or somebody's shirt would come off. I mean, it was it was geared strictly at degenerates that's exactly what it was for and i was on board man i went and saw two cards two different cards i saw a fucking nighttime tournament king of the death match i saw dudes jumping off fucking buildings it was insane um but totally fun i loved it but now as i've gotten older i don't care to see it i don't want i don't need to see a bunch of guys getting ground into dust i mean it just it's because I keep thinking about how bad it must hurt. I keep thinking about, Jesus Christ, how would you do this to yourself? What's going to happen in 15 years when you need that eardrum? You know what I mean? It's like so fucking strange. So I, I, I was trepidatious going into the three-way death match, the three-way Cracker Barrel death match between Joy Janela, Jimmy Havoc, and Darby Allen. And uh, they ring the bell. And immediately, uh, oh, by the way, Jimmy Havoc is armed with a staple gun, like at all times, I believe. Jimmy, That's Jimmy Havoc's weapon of choice. Joy Janela... I will also use the staple gun occasionally. Whatever. A staple gun comes out in the first five seconds of the match. And somehow they fucking, they, they take Darby Allen and they staple him. And he's like, ouch. Or no, it wasn't there. It was Jimmy Havoc. They take Jimmy Havoc and they, they fucking duct tape him to a chair. I think it was like they're fucking beating his ass and they duct tape him to a chair. And then they dumped thumbtacks like all over him. And then, and look, by the way, this is months ago. So I'm trying to go off memory, but this I'll never forget. They fucking like beat on him until he opens his mouth and then they fill his mouth with thumbtacks and then they fucking put duct tape over his mouth like electrical tape. And and I mean, the fans are just like, oh, God. I mean, because again, you, we've all seen the three stooges. Curly gets a light bulb in his mouth. Somebody punches him. He swallows the fucking thing. That's just what happens, man. So now the whole match, you're waiting for fucking Jimmy Havoc to get punched where he swallows a mouthful of goddamn thumbtacks and ruins everything. It's just grim. And you're on pins and fucking, you're, you know what? I'm on thumbtacks. I'm on pins and thumbtacks waiting for him to swallow that shit. And then the match goes on. Now, I'll tell you this. Darby Allen, so his hook, the staple gun is, I, I believe it's Jimmy Havoc's. But here's what Darby Allen does. Darby Allen brings out to every match now. I told you he skateboards down. He's got makeup on his face. Little wispy goth dude looking like fucking, you know, Bella Lugosi's dead. Little Bauhaus guy who's going to come in and fuck guys up. Uh, but he's also tiny. And you're like, in real life, I would fuck that dude up. But also then you see the crazy shit he does. You're like, I don't want to fucking cross this guy. He's going to murder me. It's going to be terrible. Uh, I'm, it's going to be my turn in the cracker barrel if he fucking gets a hold of me. But this fucking dude brings a body bag to the ring whenever he fights. Like a legit off an ambulance, out of a fucking morgue, whatever the fuck, body bag. And on the body bag, he will have the name of the person he's fighting. So, like, he fought Cody Rhodes, and I believe the body bag had the words Cody, like, taped on it. You know, with, he, he makes it with, like, glow tape. And, uh, but here's the thing, all right? He did, he brought it out for this fucking, he brought, brings the body bag out. But inevitably, whenever Darby Allen brings the body bag to the ring and he fights somebody... Uh, this is completely true. Uh, he winds up stuffed in the body bag because he's a totally small, shrimpy dude. So he winds up getting the worst of the match. And then, then his fucking opponent brings the body bag and, and stuffs Darby Allen into the body bag and then zips it up and then kicks the shit out of him. Winds up like stomping on his head while he's trapped in a body bag. And uh, no, thank you, man. No, no, you are not putting me in a body bag. It's bad enough whenever they put like the Undertaker in a coffin and shit. I know he's laying in there for fucking forty five minutes. I, I, uh, I don't, I, I don't like those small places. I, I can't be restrained. I don't know if it's claustrophobia or what the fuck it is. When I was a kid, when we would play football, and you'd wind up at the bottom of a pile, if if guys like, like tallied or, or 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 dallied i guess you would say or whatever the fuck they, they uh tarried they tarried or they dallied there you go with getting off the pile i'd be like get off get off get off like i i couldn't 
I didn't want any, and I'd start fucking like, like really fucking rolling around and shit, trying to get them off me. Cause I can't, I don't like being fucking squeezed like that, but it, which sounds so weird. Cause again, I like sleeping in a small, like I sleep in a chair because it's small. It feels womb. Like I like sleeping in a car. It's womb. Like, but if I can't move, like if I know in my brain, I can't move, I'll lose my fucking mind. I got no interest in that. So when he puts Darby Allen in the fucking body bag, it smashes the shit out of him. You're just like, oh no, get him out of that fucking bag. It just, it freaks me the fuck out, man. But I guess my point is with about Darby Allen, he, uh, he's fun to watch. He does all sorts of crazy shit. He does crazy bumps in the match against Cody. He was on the top fucking turnbuckle. And then he, uh, he went to jump off at, like backwards. And then he landed on his back, flat backed half, just halfway, like one shoulder blade on the fucking ring apron and then landed on the floor. Oh my God. I just made this sick noise. And in that match, dude, they brought, so I don't know if Jimmy Havoc swallowed any fucking thumbtacks, but eventually he got unstuck and then they wound up fighting and they're jumping off shit and people are falling and there's fucking, like I said, razor wire. It's, it's just a mess. That shit is fucking rough to watch. But Darby Allen, this fucking guy, this last week he fought a guy named John Moxley. So he comes to the ring. He's got a body bag, says Mox on it. Guess what happens? I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, guess what happens? Oh, did he? Yeah. He lost control and he lost the match. Uh, Yeah. He loses the fucking match. So here's the thing. Then they filmed a vignette, which is really, I have to admit, really fucking cool. He was kind of forlorn and he skateboards out of the arena in black and white. The only thing that's in color is the, is the MOX on the body bag. And then he goes to some concert. This is the fucking weirdest thing. He skateboards into this concert and then he gets on stage and then they zip him into the body bag and they put him out and it's a full, full house, full crowd. And they, pass him along like you know how if you when a singer would like kind of fall backwards under the uh, crowd surf well they just take darby allen while he's living he's in a body bag and they put him on the fans and the fans start to pass him to the back of the arena he zipped into the body bag and and i watched it and i was just it was the coolest vignette it was really fucking cool black and white and uh and you know he was like until next time mox or whatever the fuck because he's gonna fight him next time but it fucking freaked me out because he was zipped up in a goddamn body bag, zipped up in a body bag, getting passed along, crowd surfed. And I'm just like, oh, dude, I just I couldn't even imagine not being able to move because he can't unzip it. I don't I, look. Let's put it this way. Body bags are a one way, one way street. They don't anticipate anybody getting zipped up into one needing to zip himself the fuck out. So when you get zipped in, you've got to, somebody's got to let you the fuck out. So if somehow, again, you're a very trusting man, you get fucking thrown out into a crowd because if that crowd just turned bad, they turned like they thought it would be funny. Uh, and then they just kind of pulled you down into the crowd and they kind of, uh, they sat, they stood on top of you or they fucking just squished you and they wouldn't let you out of the bag. Jesus Christ, dudes. I, I, and I, I know it's ridiculous for me to go, Hey, what if that crowd turned bad and they decided to keep you in the body bag forever? But if you put yourself in a fucked up position, like being in a goddamn body bag, then guess what? Eventually something bad's going to happen because you wind up in a fucking body bag. But also this, I've seen him lose all the matches he brings the body bag to. Quit bringing the body bag. You don't get to be that. You don't, you're not that guy anymore. You can't be spectacular if you keep losing and getting stuffed into your own body bag. If you're going to bring a body bag, eventually you got to beat somebody and put them in the fucking body bag. I mean, it's cool that you bring the body bag and that's fun as, as fuck and it's a neat little fucking signature, but then you lose and you wind up getting stuffed in the body bag. You know what that's like? It's like the fucking, like if you were a nerd at school. And you were like, you took karate. You're like, ha ha, I know karate now. And you went to school and everybody, all your bullies are like, fuck you, dick. And you're like, ha ha, I know karate. And then they used more karate and fucked you up. You don't get to pull out karate anymore because you just got out karate. Your karate is not strong enough. This is not the karate you're looking for. You try to fucking karate your bully and your bully karate the shit out of you. And you can't bring out any more fucking karate. So uh, this guy needs to s- s- fucking hang up the body bag. It's like my, I, look, my favorite fighters are guys like the Diaz brothers. They don't give no fucks. Okay. That's what they'll tell you. They, they, they don't, they, I'll say they don't give any fucks because I like to talk like a proper Englishman, but they don't give no fucks. That's their whole deal. And they talk a bunch of Yang, not ridiculous Yang about their opponents so much, but about how they're the fucking toughest dudes and they just want to fight and blah, blah, blah. But then there was a guy named Nick Diaz. He's one of the Diaz brothers. And Nick talks a bunch of shit, talked a bunch of shit about George St. Pierre, talks a bunch of shit about other guys. Then if he fights, I mean, he hasn't fought in like five years because he crawled into a bong, but when he would fight, then he'd get fucking starched. And afterwards he would talk shit about how he didn't really lose. And then he'd talk shit in the next fight. And you're like, whoa, 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 hold on here. 
I mean, you got to admit you lost. You got to admit that. And if you come out talking shit, you can go, hey, you. Every time you talk shit and you lose a fight, it just loses its appeal. There's a guy named Chael Sonnen. He was just doing a wrestling character in MMA. He would talk a bunch of shit and then he'd lose. And then he'd come back out and he'd go, I didn't lose that fight. Ah, uh, no, I'm going to get the next guy. He was like the Black Knight and fucking Monty Python. And I, I get the gimmick. But the whole point of MMA was it's supposed to be more realistic than wrestling. So in wrestling, yeah, guys get their ass beat all the time and then talk about how they're undefeated. Fine. But in MMA, we just saw you fucking tap out because you got choked the fuck out. With 30 seconds left in your dream fight, Chael Sonnen, you literally beat Anderson Silva for four rounds and in four minutes and 30 seconds of the fifth round. And then you tap the fuck out to a choke. Like, quite frankly, a pussy. You could have just fucking held on. And look... I'm not calling Chael Sonnen a pussy. I'm not calling MMA fighter a pussy. I'd be fucking murdered in a second. I get it. But if you talk a bunch of shit and then you tap out to a choke with 30 seconds left, you don't even fucking struggle or fight or try to get out of it, really. Uh, and then because afterwards, I felt so bad for him. Because I look, I hated Chael Sonnen because Anderson Silva was one of my favorite fighters. I wanted him to fucking turn this guy into a goddamn gravy stain. And then in the middle of the fight, I went, you know what? Fucking Chael Sonnen said he was going to do some shit and he's doing it. Like he called his shot. He pointed over the fence and then he was just fucking crushing balls over the fence. The problem was, you know, Babe Ruth got one at bat to do it. Well, Chael's got to do it for five fucking rounds, but he did. He fucking smoked the spider for four rounds and then for four and a half minutes in the final round. And then he gets put in a choke and he taps. And I, I felt miserable for him. I was like, oh man, this was a fucking lifelong dream. He called his shot and he was making it fucking happen. And then he tapped out to a stupid choke. Uh, it just, it just, it almost seemed like instinct for him to tap out. It was just, it was almost seemed quick. He didn't really fight it. And then after the fight, he's, he's giving an interview and he's sad and he's, he's, cause he had dedicated the fight to his father. And then you saw the mask come off where he's like, you know, all the bravado and shit was gone. And he's like, you know, man, Anderson caught me and, and, and he was so dejected and forlorn and I felt for him and I was like, all right, you know what? I'm on board with this guy. But then, like, in an hour, he was at the fucking after fight talking about how he'd never lost and doing the, and I'll tell you the next time. And he's trying to do the Muhammad Ali fucking talking Yang and all. And you're just like, whoa, 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 dude. Give us a chance to like you, man. Don't go back into cell mode right away. Take tonight to own the fact that you, quite frankly, had your dream at your fingertips and you let it fucking slip away. It's okay to be vulnerable now in the press conference, but... Instead, he played the role and then it worked for him. He made a ton of money because he kept getting fights and he kept losing, man. He got a rematch with Spider. He got his ass beat because he tried that whole fucking spinning elbow for no good reason. And then he got pinned against the cage. He got a fucking knee that caved in his chest. It was gorgeous. But then he pretended like that didn't happen. Said he was undefeated. And, then he, and it's all this. And they're like, everybody's like, ah, no, it's just all carnival. They're just selling fights. And it's like, man, I don't, you know, fuck. I don't need to see a guy selling fights you know, there's a, nick diaz the way he put it like they don't sell fights because they're that's the reason i like the diaz brothers they're just real dudes from the streets of fucking stockton who just like to fight i don't care for the fact that when they lose a fight then they're just like well you know uh the thing is i you know i came in you know i i, I was i wasn't really losing and they, i was just about to take over when that happened in a fluky punch like they always have an excuse which they which is a fucking drag but before that and the build-up to the fight like they called it selling wolf tickets that's the first time i ever heard the fucking phrase nick diaz says you're out here selling wolf tickets which is a, a fancy way or an interesting way of saying you're just talking shit man you're just trying to convince people to buy this fucking fight saying you're gonna do a bunch of shit that you're never gonna fucking do so you're selling wolf tickets to everybody and uh i thought that was fucking great because Nick was like, I'm not going to fucking talk a bunch of shit. I hate this fucking guy. Like he was like all of the Diaz trash talk came from a real place. Guys like Conor McGregor and these other assholes, they, they're, they're just, and look, I like Conor McGregor. I like fighters, but these guys who talk Yang, there's a guy now, uh, I, I don't even want to say his fucking name. Colby Covington is his name. He's a UFC fighter. And his whole gimmick is he's a MAGA guy. He's a Trump guy. Trump actually came to see his fight. Like literally, that's and that's not even a joke. Uh, Donald Trump Jr. and Eric came to his last fight, and then Donald Trump himself came to see Nate Diaz fight Jorge Masvidal, um, and he got booed out of the fucking building, and it was hilarious. So then he had to go to the fucking Alabama football game because he knew people would cheer him there. But like <clears throat> Trump, the Trump kids, they formed a relationship with Colby Covington. He's playing the role of MAGA guy, like he um, he wears the hat the make America great again hat. He walks around with strippers and pretends like they're his girlfriends. Uh, and it's funny because all these people on the inside, like that know him that from his gym, 
they, you know, when this shit started out, they were just like, this is just Colby. He, this is what he thinks he needs to do to make money. He's got to act like a fucking idiot and it's going to attract fighters and make money. And, and that's how he wants to handle it. And everybody's like, cool. Um, until it, he just kept it up and he won't fucking stop. And you're just like, so now there's people who are like, no, Colby's really a good guy. This is all an act. And other people are like, fuck him. I don't care. This is the stupidest act ever. And he's actually lost a bunch of friends and a bunch of his teammates from the gym won't train with him. Because he's such a trash talking fucking asshole. And because he takes it, he's super cringe too. Because he just fucking, like, Matt Hughes is a tool bag, but he's one of the greatest fighters in the history of the UFC. But he got hit by a train. <laughs> and I know that sounds ridiculous. But he literally was in a truck that got hit by a train. Somehow he got caught, caught at a crossing signal. And there's been speculation that maybe he did it on purpose. Like, maybe he didn't want to be here anymore. And, uh, and, and you thought, you thought me hiring a bunch of monkeys to tear me to pieces was, was a fucking stretch. How about a dude who's going to park his pickup truck on a goddamn fucking train track and ruin everybody else's day. So it's, it's nothing's been established yet. You know, uh, the, his family and stuff are like, no, of course Matt didn't do that. But then there are people who are like, well, no, he, you know, we, there's a reason he was parked on a fucking train crossing at two in the morning and they're speculating either he was drunk and asleep or he just wanted to end it. But then there are people like, no, that's a real scary train crossing, and he might have got caught. Oh, who the fuck knows? Who, regardless, Matt Hughes, great fighter. Uh, unfortunate incident with a train. <laughs> well, after Colby Covington's last win, uh, he, he he the guy he beat was a teammate of Matt Hughes for a long time. Like Robbie Lawler's been fighting for a long time, and he was from Matt's gym, and he was good friends with him. And he said uh, he said something like, "I I beat you worse than Matt Hughes got beat by that train, or something like that." And it was just, it's just, it's artless snark. It's fucking stupid trash talk. It makes no sense. It's just shitty. You just, because you already won the fight. That's another thing. He's won the fight already. And Robbie Lawler's a stand-up dude. And you're going to talk shit about his friend in the ring. It's just, it's, so that's why a lot of his teammates are like, I can't fucking rally behind Colby. He's just a fucking dick. And he is. He's a complete fucking tool bag. And it's just, it's just terrible to watch. But he's got a title fight coming up in December. And hopefully he gets fucked up by a guy named, like, there's a fighter named Kam- Kam- Kamaru Usman, and I believe he's from Nigeria. His name's Kamaru. Uh, but when he was in college, he would go by Marty sometimes because people couldn't pronounce Kamaru. So he was like, all right, so he would go by Marty. So Colby will only call him Marty. And Kamaru's like, it's not my name. You know, don't be that. And Kamaru's also kind of cringy too, but not like that. Kamaru's, Kamaru's just trying to trash talk, but he's not good at it. But Colby Covington just trash talks too much and it's stupid. He's not good at it either. It's just a fucking mess. But he keeps calling him Marty and and it's it's borderline racist. And I know that you think that that's silly because it's just he's just calling him Marty, a name he used in college. But Kamaru, it's it's along the lines of uh, when they wouldn't call Muhammad Ali Muhammad Ali, and they were calling him Cassius in interviews, and he'd be like, "What's my name?" When he uh, I Ernie Terrell, I I, I've, I don't remember who the fuck it was in the What's My Name fight. But it's with um, Max is going to yell at me. He's going to be so mad at me. Um, but Muhammad Ali is beating this guy's ass and going, "What's my name? What's my name?" Trying to make him say Muhammad Ali. So it's it's just a shitty racist thing to do. If there's a dude who says, "Hey, my, my you know," especially a guy who you know he's from. Uh, it's it's a native name from where he's from, and when he came to America to make it to, he to make it easier on people said all right call me Marty but now he's the fucking world champion so you know what call him Kamaru that's his fucking name or Kamaru I don't I don't know how he pronounces it but I'm pretty sure it's Kamaru Usman and and fucking Colby's like all right Marty you're fucking fake news and like literally he uses fake news he said he's like he pret- he pretends like he's a long lost Trump brother it's fucking embarrassing but he's in a title fight because he's a good fighter. And, uh, but the thing is, it's just phony bullshit. Whereas the Diaz brothers aren't phony bullshit until they lose. And then they engage in all sorts of, Hey, I shouldn't have lost that fight. I, my arm, Ooh, my arm, you know, and all that nonsense. And it's a, that's a drag to see. Um, like Nate got tuned up. Nate got tuned up by Jorge Masvidal in the fight for the bad motherfucker belt. And it was great. It was a good fight. Um, but Diaz would have fought till he was dead. However, he got cut in the second round and he had a fucking huge goddamn two car garage above his eye. So a doctor stopped the fight before the fourth round. And, and Nate was furious because Nate, well, again, he'll fight until you got to peel him off the fucking canvas. And also he maintains that Jorge Masvidal was tiring out and he had him just where he wanted him because Nate is known for a fucking his cardio. And he claimed that he was about to turn it up in the fourth and fifth rounds. That was his whole strategy. 
But all the fighters know that if you get cut, there's a chance they'll stop the fucking fight. That's just the way it works. So it would have been cooler. I mean, he didn't go after Masvidal really as much as the refs and everything else. But it's just a drag when a guy is like, you're like, dude, what the fuck? Why are you admit you got tuned up? It's okay to admit you got tuned up. And you can say, hey, look, I'm disappointed they stopped the fight. I understand why they did because of this gigantic fucking second mouth above my eye. But uh, all, you know, all to Jorge and hopefully we can do it again. You know, that, that's the kind of shit you want to see. Uh, how do we spin off into this? I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so anyway, oh, so here's the thing. So if you, if you talk shit and you keep losing, you shouldn't be able to talk shit anymore. I understand you're trying to sell a fight or make yourself viable, but you just make yourself look ludicrous. And that's how I feel about Darby Allen. You bring a body bag to the ring and inevitably you wind up stuffed in the body bag. You can't do that. It's like getting out karate by your fucking bully. You can't fucking make that happen. Stop bringing the body bag. You'll stop getting stuffed in it. No matter whose fucking initials are on the goddamn thing. Right. And then you can ride your skateboard with some dignity and not pretend like, hey, that bully just stuffed me in my own body bag. God damn it. What a fucking drag. <laughs> uh, the, look, the whole point of this that I was the whole the whole reason of bringing up Darby Allen. Incorrect. Uh, what I was going to say was I was talking about male chimp and, and then we, we spun off in an army of chimps beating up an army of rats. Uh, and again, just a fist of chimps. Uh, isn't that's what it's called when, a, when there's like a pride of lions and a gaggle of geese and a murder of crows and a fist of chimps. I'll tell you what, they missed an opportunity with the murder of chimps. How do you fucking give the crows murder? Fuck, unless it's a Hitchcock movie or some fucking corn, nobody's getting killed by a goddamn crow. You got to go murder of chimps because at any second, they are a coin flip to tear your ball sack off and laugh in your fucking face with a hearty, chimpy laugh. <laughs> Is that a chimp laugh? It's more like an old guy laugh. <laughs> I guess that's more of a laugh. That's a chimpy laugh. Uh, I want to know how many times I've done a chimp on this show. <laughs> That's uh, how many times we find our way to monkeys, monkeys and midgets. Whenever we're doing this fucking show, we find our way to monkeys and midgets and then other unpleasant things that we've talked about in the past. But you know what? It's all par for the course. It's all grist for the mill. It's all yin for the yang, yin for the yang, I guess. Uh, it, what I was telling you initially was that I was doing MailChimp and I was putting you all on a mailing list. By the way, if you want to be on that mailing list, then why wouldn't you? Hey, Mike, add me at gmail.com. Hey, Mike, add me at gmail.com. And I'll throw you in there. Uh, whether you live in the desert or what, what country you live in the desert or not. Uh, well, it's not the plugs yet. Why am I going into this mode? Uh, the, the point is MailChimp. I, it's, I've been away for a long time. 2014, I think was the last time I sent a newsletter. So they, you know, they whacked all my fucking names, whatever the fuck we've talked about that brutal. But here's the thing. I go to sign up with the MailChimp now. Now MailChimp costs money. I think I mentioned this last week. MailChimp wants my dough. Uh, once I get to a certain amount of names and look, I hope I get to enough names where I have to pay MailChimp. That'd be great. I don't want the basic service. I want the Cadillac. I want the fucking Cadillac. I want the cat. There you go. That's the fucking punk podcast snap. I want the Cadillac of services, baby. Uh, but Here's the thing MailChimp does that fucking blew me away when I, because, because look, nobody just does their fucking thing anymore. All right. MailChimp, just, just, just be monkeys or mail. That's all that anybody cares about. It's like Uber. Uber now is fucking their Uber. Like, Hey, we'll drive you around. By the way, we also have a paid bro lending service. Did you know that? Also, Uber is getting into Uber Eats. We'll bring you your food. Also, Uber has like an Uber bank where you can go ahead and put your money and let it chill out. And uh, I mean, Uber is... I, I, the payroll lending thing freaked me the fuck out. I'm like, you're not ruining people's lives enough. Now you're going to go ahead and take their fucking paychecks. Every time I send into the Uber app, they're like, hey, man, you uh, you forgot to sign up for the Uber debit card. Yeah, you're fucking a right. I forgot to sign up. You're not getting some interest rate off of me, you fucks. It's bad enough I'm doing this. Believe me, I'm not proud that I have to drive people around for you motherfuckers. Unfortunately, that's where I bottomed out. That's the trap door of my life got pulled. And as I'm fucking hanging from the noose trying to gain my last breaths, uh, I have to be behind the wheel of a car for you fuckheads. Um, but again, that's my fault. Nobody else's. Uh, but but that, and they have all these other offers. And I'm like, fuck you. I don't. They prey on people, man. They just fucking find these poor people or, or people who think there's an opportunity where they can get extra money. And I, like I read something about a guy in San Francisco and he's like, he's driving five, 12 hour days and he's, he's making two to $300 a day. And he said, yeah, but a lot more people drive a lot more than me. And I'm like, who else is driving more than 60 fucking hours, especially in San Francisco? Jesus Christ. I mean, I told you they fucked the rates up so bad in LA. Even if I drove that amount of time, I'd be dead and I wouldn't make nearly enough money to die. And then the gas and all the other bullshit you're paying for. What the fuck? Nobody cares. 
eventually I'll be back in the Uber car and I'll tell you about what it's like. But then, <laughs> but up till then, listen to me bitch about it. Ah. Um, so MailChimp, again, so Uber is branched out. Now they're payroll lending. They got all these different things. And the same thing with fucking MailChimp. MailChimp isn't just, look, it's just a mailing list place. That's what it's supposed to be. Hey, man, let's do a mailing list and you can give us your names and then we'll eventually erase them and fuck you over. Fine. But now MailChimp has broadened themselves into a media company of some sort. So now not only do they have all these fucking emails and all these fucking lists, dudes, MailChimp is a fucking podcasting network. Are you shitting me? And and it's not all about business. Like, I understand if they were like, look, if it's mailing list podcasts you want to listen to and that's boring as fuck, that's fine. Some nerd audibly pushing his glasses up while he tells you to keep on top of your list and shit like that, man. I just tried to talk all through a yawn and that was bad. Uh, but as, but a fucking dude just this, well, here's what I believe. You should alphabetize. Fuck you, your alphabetized podcast, MailChimp. Just fucking let people list shit. Don't try to give me mass media and appeal to my fucking senses. But that's what they're trying to do. So, uh, because I saw, because then it's like all, if it's nerd podcast, that's fine. I guess I understand that alphabetize fucking Dewey decimal hosts one, whatever the fuck, but dudes, and this was, I have to admit, this was fucking depressing for me. You know who, ho- they have an entertainment podcast, at least one that I saw, you know who hosts it, man? What the fuck's that noise? It's like a bell. Can you guys hear that? Maybe not. I hear a fucking bell in the background. Um, maybe someone wants me to bring out my dead. I'll bring out my dead. Bring out your dead. Not quite dead yet. All right. Uh, MailChimp has a podcast. It's a, it's an entertainment. I don't know if it's a music podcast exclusively. It's hosted by uh, Shirley Manson from Garbage. And, and look, I, I know everybody needs a side hustle. Not everybody can be skateboarding with a body bag and making big, sweet AEW money. Not everybody's like me with a very popular Patreon account and a SoFi account you can sign up for. I'll tell you about later. <laughs> but Shirley Manson, like I, I don't know. I guess I held her to some standard where I, I was hoping she'd be better than that. I, I, that she's in the MailChimp business. And I know you're thinking, no, MailChimp's in the Shirley Manson business. No, fuck that. Shirley Manson's in the MailChimp business. She made this decision. She took this leap. Um, where's Butch Vig when you need him to fucking just grab her by the shoulders and go, look, no, 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 you, you can't do this. Uh, this is, it's just, it's foolishness. It's wrong. You're, you're, I don't know. I, and again, why am I disillusioned? Everybody's got to make a buck. Go ahead and make all the fucking money you can go ahead and bring it down. But when I saw Shirley Manson's name, cause again, also all the other MailChimp podcasts that I saw are like Alfred Alfredson tells you about pens. I mean, I, dude, what the fuck? I mean, I'm sure there's, I'm sure Alfred's got plenty to say about pens and good for him. But Shirley Manson is a genuinely funny, entertaining, and talented person. So I guess I'm happy that she's getting money somewhere. I'm more mad at MailChimp for branching out, I suppose. But Shirley Manson, I don't give a fuck. Everybody should give her money. See her on the street, give her five bucks. She deserves it. She's fucking Shirley Manson. Just for the fact, just Google a picture of Shirley Manson wearing boots on stage and just go, yep, that's worth it, without even having to hear her sing. She deserves it just for the fucking, uh, the, is there a pretenders? Is it in special? Yeah. In special, she does the fucking pretenders nod. We're the saga, the town, we're the saga, the town, dude, those first three garbage albums are fucking smoking. They're fucking so good. Uh, and I'll fight you. I will fight you. Damn it. And now she works for MailChimp, these assholes. I just, it makes me so depressed. And it, I, I, I'm not depressed. She makes money. Good, good for her. I'm glad Shirley Manson found a way to make dough. Um, it's better than what? She's going to be out Ubering and being interviewed by fucking someone who goes, hey, how many hours a week are you in the car? Hey, aren't you Shirley Manson? Yes, I was. Because I'll tell you this, if she's Ubering, she will not be happy when it rains. Oh, <laughs> there's no doubt about that. Jesus Christ, that sounds like a setup, but I swear to God, I just thought of it. Um, if you're Ubering, you're just not happy when it rains. Because uh, people tried in and out of your car with their wet feet, and then you're driving in the rain trying not to die. Ah, it's a fucking mess. Uh, so I got a list, folks. I got a list. I got plans. You know this. We know this. And uh, let's talk a little bit about these plans. Let's talk about a list that I have. Let's talk about the fact that, uh, you know, I talked a couple of weeks ago about a Hail Mary and all this other nonsense. Uh, could it happen? Would it happen? Could it possibly happen? What could be the case? What would make it happen? Um, I'm here to tell you guys that, uh, the hail Mary came through 
Now, I will tell you this. It is not nearly what I thought it was going to be. Remember I told you that they, there was, they quoted me some fantastical amount. Um, and I was just like, well, there's no way I'm getting that. But if I got a tenth of that, I would have been like, okay, well, this will be fine. Um, and I, I, this will sound so weird. It's a confidential thing. Like it said, like it says that all the paperwork I signed, like I shouldn't, I guess I shouldn't be telling you about it. And I'll be honest with you, I haven't seen anybody talk about it online. I haven't seen any news stories about it. I don't know how the fuck this happened, but it happened. And, uh, I went to my mailbox and I got a check and it was ridiculous. Like I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's not, look, all it means is I can sort of, again, it's just a base of operations. It's not, it's not take off work money. It's not, Hey, spending and traveling money. It's, it's a chunk of money that gives me that makes sure I don't have to jump in the car immediately. But as I told you a couple of weeks ago, I got to, I got to work out a schedule and do it right. This is a gift you can't ignore. So, uh, so I will be back in the car. Um, I'm, I'm, that's on the list, how, how I'm going to pr- approach that, what I'm going to do. Uh, you know, I paid, I, I, you know, I paid a few bills that I had, um, you know, nothing super pressing or whatever the fuck, but stuff that had to be done. Um, and, uh, and I had, so I have, a, I have some, again, I, I can't, it's, it's not this, again, it's not a life changing amount of money. It's not even a month changing amount of money. If anything, it's just, like I said, it's the base of a pyramid that allows me to, instead of me having to do stuff now to make money immediately, I can now make money and, and I, I'm safe. Does that make sense? Uh, and look, if I told you this amount, you'd just be like, ah, that's fucking nothing. Cause it is, it truly is. Remember when I got a hundred dollar check a couple of weeks ago and I was like, God damn, I needed this hundred dollar check. Okay. Imagine something like that. But, but you know, again, it's just, it's, uh, I'm tap dancing around this for no good reason because you don't fucking care. All you all you know is the Hail Mary came through. That's all you need to hear. So I mentioned I got a list. I got plans. Uh, 2020 is the year of I will. And so I, uh, I have a list of, um, things that I have to do here before the end of 2019. I've had to sit down and make a six week goal list. Um, and, and I'm excited to, to make it happen. And, uh, among them are, you know, re-sign up for insurance. Um, there's a couple of listeners who've reached out with, uh, amazingly cool things that they want to do for the show. And I've got to finalize those with both of them. Uh, I've got to finish my Twitch channel. It's kind of incomplete. So there's things that I had planned to do and I get, I need to get that done. Uh, I need to work on the website, get the newsletter rolling. Um, YouTube videos. I want to start doing at least one a week, Patreon videos and posts, at least one a week building up to more, but this is just the ramp up in the next six weeks. Um, and then here's, here's, these are, this is where I'm kind of bogged down right now, obviously by, uh, the show coming out on Friday, but this is the, these are the challenging ones that are going to make me get my, my head straight. All right. The other stuff is all, that's just work stuff. YouTube, Patreon, um, getting the ball rolling on the, on the things with, with the other listeners who've offered to participate, getting Twitch built up. Um, but creating and adhering to a uniform sleep schedule. And, I, and look, this is going to be boring radio. I got to do this for you. This is going to be a boring podcast now where I just kind of reiterate what I'm planning to do. Uh, but I, I just throw it out into the ether. I talk about it because it's important to me. And this is what's going on in my life now. I'm trying to make these structural changes. And uh, I know, ridiculous. But, but, but and especially when you're 52, this is, this is shit you should have straightened out by now, man. It just is. Uh, create and adhere to a uniform sleep schedule. What I want to do is be in bed by one o'clock AM every night and up by nine. Uh, I've talked before about my trainer wants me in bed by like 11 and I just, I just don't think that can happen, but one to nine, that makes sense. I've still got the whole day ahead of me at nine. I go to bed at one still late sort of. Um, I think that'll work for a while. So I'm going to start that. Um, the, well, let's put it this way. I should name the most important thing. The most important thing is to create and adhere to a uniform recording schedule. Uh, clearly, as I'm bringing this to you on a Friday, uh, because that will be affecting my sleep schedule. Because um, I'll be honest with you, uh, 
yesterday, like Wednesday night, I slept like 13 hours. Like, I don't know what the fuck happened. And then I got up for three hours and then I slept for like another four hours. And then yesterday I was up and then I slept for four hours in the afternoon. And then I slept for another three and a half hours Thursday night. I, I don't even know. It's just this. And I know I'm sure it's depression, whatever the fuck. Everybody reaches out. And they've got, they know why they know what's happening inside my, uh, my body and everything else that's going on. And I get that. That's fine. Or my brain, whatever. So that could be the case. So I have to, but I have to fight that. So because, you know, I, I putting off recording or, or not being able to do it or sitting down and not, and feeling like I can't get it done. These are things I have to change. So when I sit down on Wednesday night to record, and then I put it off and I put it off and I sit down, and I put it off. And then I sleep and then I sleep for 13 fucking hours. And then I wake up and I'm like, fuck, you get it. Cause then here's what happens. I go into a shame spiral cause it's not done on time. And I get myself upset and I, I know you don't care, you know, and I don't blame you. Um, but this is just me speaking out loud about what's going on in my fucking brain and in my life. So I have to create and adhere a uniform recording schedule and that will dovetail into being able to create and adhere a uniform sleep schedule. Uh, I got to create and adhere to a uniform meal plan. I, I stop eating carbs, start cooking for myself, stop going out, all those things. I mean, I, these are all in the agenda, create and adhere to a uniform workout cardio schedule, create and adhere to a uniform driving schedule. Um, I plan on driving five days a week from maybe from seven to midnight. I was looking at that cause I don't want to be out super late with drunks. I just don't, I can't handle that anymore. Uh, I also can't get up super early and take people to work. So if I drive seven to midnight, that still comes into the rubric of the one o'clock uh, you know, a um, curfew that I've implied for myself. Um, and along with the Twitch schedule, I can Twitch from like three to six thirty every day and then drive from seven to 12. I, I, again, these are all, it's all works in progress, but I have a list and I have plans. That's important stuff. So I want to create and adhere sleep schedule, recording schedule, meal plan, workout, cardio schedule, driving schedule. I know these are things you should just do. I shouldn't share them with you, but but they're what I'm going through. Um, and another thing that I had on the list, and uh, this is this is a big deal for me. Um, you know, I, I'll tell you, I haven't had, uh, I had chocolate, what, Tuesday? So I plan on not having any. I, I plan on, I, like, I, I don't want to have any more. <laughs> If that makes sense, um, that that is something that has been almost the bane of my existence. I mean, I'm, I always turn to it. I always make sure it's there. It's it's just it's comfort. That's all it is. It's childhood. I've told you this a million times. I can bury myself in chocolate and not even think about it. Those giant bars. I'll just sit. I'll just sit and shovel them into my fucking mouth. And it's one of the reasons why I am where I am right now. And I'm so disappointed in where I've 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 wound up. But, you know, we all you do is you move forward. You work on it. And uh, and that's my hope, you know, that I can avoid it. And, and uh, I'll do the best I can. But another important thing for me is, uh, you know, chocolate is a poison in my life. And, and it's something I do to myself. And, the, and another thing I do to myself, and I have to, uh, <laughs> you'll laugh. Um, on my list... This is, is, this is, I wrote, escape from the prison you've made for yourself. Um, and what I, and, and I followed that up with be free with an exclamation point. Escape from the prison you've made for yourself. Be free. Now that can apply to chocolate. That can apply, that can apply to all of my behaviors. Because this is a prison I've made for myself. I, I act... The way I act because of me, my brain, my makeup, my upbringing, all of it. I choose to be this way. I choose to eat chocolate. I choose to not work out. I, I you know, I can't blame anything but myself. But also, um, in the escape from the prison you've made for yourself, I, uh, I have to eliminate my ex from my life. I have to find a way to, to move on. <laughs> I know that sounds ridiculous, particularly because it's, it's, I mean, believe me, it sounds ridiculous to me when I say it out loud. Um, 
you know, I, I, I still had a hundred pictures in my phone. I still had, uh, I had blocked my ex on Twitter, um, you know, a while ago because I got tired of seeing me portrayed as a toxic narcissist and a bad person. And it was all sub tweets. She never said anything about me, but she would like tweets that were, that were about getting, you know, getting away from a toxic, violent narcissist, whatever the fuck, all this dumb shit. And as I've said, I look, I recognize there is a touch of narcissism in having to go look and see and assume that shit's about me. But if you knew, you'd know that I know it's about me. I just know, I know. I know her. Um, I mean, I haven't been in a room with this person in three years. I haven't physically seen this person in three years. But they haunt my skull. And they've been a gigantic part of my life because of me. You know, I, I allow it. Um... You know, I, I, I contacted her when I was in Japan. And then when I got home, we texted back and forth about, and we were going to meet up. And then, uh, and then <laughs> thankfully, uh, she did that thing she always does. And, you know, when I was in a relationship with her, I would always scramble and go, oh my God, what happened? I'm so sorry. Oh my gosh, what are we doing? What's going on? And it said this time I just went, what the fuck? I go, hey, what do you, what do you, what? I've done nothing. What? Um, but you know, luckily I, I was, I dodged a bullet there because it's never been about, you know, Hey, I can put this back together. Hey, this can be a, a thing that works. It's been about retreating to the comfort of what once was. And, you know, I, I, I'll, 2014, I was so happy and excited and, and looking forward to what I thought was going to be the rest of my life. And I was ignoring red flags even then. And I was probably putting up some red flags myself. Uh, and you've heard, you know. And here's the thing. It's funny. You know, I've talked to Mex about stuff and he's always like, you should tell those stories. And I'm like, I, there's, nobody wants to hear those stories. He goes, everybody wants to hear those fucking stories. And I'm like, eh. You know, and I, and I understand what he's saying. But uh, it doesn't seem... It, 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 you should, I should just move the fuck on. There's no, there's no, you know, escape from the prison you've made for yourself. Be free. So, you know, but I, but I, <laughs> there have been many times and I'm like, oh yeah. And then this happened or whatever. And you know, the story is about my life. And so I could tell stories from my life and, and, but I also, I'll be honest. I don't remember what I've talked about. I don't know what you've heard. I don't want to repeat shit. I don't want to, cause, because it was such a crazy making time of my life that I don't know what I've said and whom I've said it to. I mean, there are people I confided in. Lily watched it all unfold, you know, and I talked to Mex about it for some period of time, and then he's like, I can't. You got to stop fucking telling me about this because he was just like, you got to get the fuck out of there. And I, I understood, you know, I got that. Made sense. Um, But I, you know, I couldn't. I didn't want to. I didn't want to believe that it was that, you know. Um, and again, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sitting here going, ah, I'm a genius. And then oh, I can't believe this. No, no, man. It was just, it was two people who just codependent and just fucking smashed into one another constantly all the time. The first year again was all love bombing. Well, I mean the first year that you guys knew about, you know, I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't tell you until 2014, but I mean, we'd been texting since 2011. Uh, so, uh, so it's amazing to me that that's been eight years ago. Jesus Christ. Eight years ago, but also, like I said, I haven't been in a room with this person physically in three years. And still every day I would look Facebook, Instagram, Twitter every single day. 
She had blocked me. I'll tell you, this is, <laughs> or maybe this will tell you, this will explain a little bit without going into too much detail here. Um, you know, she had blocked me on social media. When I had blocked her a while ago, she wrote me a note. This is years ago. I don't even remember how many fucking years ago. And she was like, go ahead and block me on everything. And I was like, do you have a boyfriend? And she was like, yeah, I'm dating. What do you want me to do? And I was like, I, all right, fine. Well, I don't want to be that guy's every other guy who fucking showed up when I was with you. You know, I, I just, again, like I said, I'm not, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to fucking tear the lid off of this right now. Anyway, who the fuck knows? Maybe I'll get mad enough later, but, but now it, it just seems that I should just, just fucking just let it, just let it fucking go. Right. Don't fucking pin yourself to the fucking wall over it again and again and again. So I blocked her on all that stuff. And then, uh, you know, I, I, then I unblocked her, of course, you know, and I, I would go look at what was going on and then I'd contact her from Japan and, and then she had contacted me. We made plans to get together. And then she did the fucking thing she does all the time where she freaked out on me and pretended I was hurting her and whatever the fuck that's, and that's early 2018. You know, that's fucking February of 2018. Then I texted her a few times, you know, reached out to her and she would send like a smiley face emoticon. You know, she would just fucking blow me off, which is fine. You know, made sense because what the fuck am I doing? Right. So then um, she blocked me on everything. So I couldn't see her stuff. And I'm like, all right, well, that's fine. And then uh, this year, and again, I'm not, I'm not going into full details, you know, there's, but then in, um, she texted me on my birthday, uh, <clears throat> which was nice, you know, and, uh, and unblocked me on all social media that day. Uh, and I had had her unblocked on Facebook and Instagram. It's, it's a game. I'm not going to lie. It's just a fucking game. This thing in my brain where I'm like, well, I, I don't need to block her. I can prove that I don't need to do that. And let's be a grown up and that a grown ups don't block. And, um, well, no, it just meant that I would run for it if it was available. And the second she took the fucking barrier off, I, I ran for it. I kept her blocked on Twitter. Uh, but that's no, I'm no fucking hero. It's because I could see her account, but she couldn't see mine. She unblocked me there too. So, and I went in and I looked and, uh, you know, and she, again, wrote me just a nice birthday note. Um, she also sent a, a photo of us kissing, which I thought was a little fucking strange, but I mean, Hey, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, but it was enough to, to fucking set it all in motion again. So every day, multiple times a day, go look at the page, go look at this page, go look at this page, interpret that. What could that mean? What could this mean? By the way, uh, <clears throat> she's, uh, she's, she's happy with a new guy and lives with him. So what the fuck am I doing? What am I looking at? But also at the same time, why are you sending me a photo of me kissing you? If you live with somebody, I don't know. I don't fucking know, man. I, I, I have my ideas and I, I, but I don't, I don't like making this show so laser focused, but, um, <clears throat> At the same time, uh, there was a <laughs> there was a quote I saw, and it and it kind of resonated with me. And it was, uh, "You own everything that happened to you. Tell your stories. If people wanted you to write warmly about them, they should have behaved better." And that resonated with me. Um, certainly through 2015 and 16 when I may not have been as forthcoming because I was trying to make sure that things were okay in real life. <laughs> so I <laughs> might have portrayed things here to be a little better than they were. And, uh, and so, you know, I got that photo of us kissing and then I saw she lived with a guy and I was like, all right, she lives with a dude. And, and again, maybe it's just me misinterpreting Hey, hope your birthday is filled with chocolate and kisses and a photo of me kissing her. Uh, I, I, again, I could, I'm, I will fully accept the fact that 
I have a weak spot in this area. And that's why I have to escape from the prison I've made from myself and be free. Uh, I, I, cause again, like I said, it's not even about this. Well, you know, maybe you give it another go. No, it's none of that shit. It's, it's, it's when you were addicted to something and you reminisce about how good you felt when you were addicted to that. And you wouldn't mind reintroducing that addiction. Also, I, I've, I've learned a lot about myself. It's funny when my birthday was on a Monday and I got that. She texted me real early in the morning. And I was in bed and my fucking, I heard her song because her, I, her song still plays with her texts. She had actually texted me in April too. And that was weird because it was, uh, it went off in the middle of a therapy session with Shannon. Um, and, and Shannon's aware of this and her, <laughs> And so we were sitting there and all of a sudden it just fucking, the song played and I fucking froze, man. And, uh, and that text was empty. It was like a long, empty bubble. And I know what that is. All right. And I, I, you could say, oh, it was a butt dial or, oh, it was an accident. But I mean, we, she hadn't texted me for like a month she had texted. She also reached out when I did the show about Maki and Brody, and that was very nice of her, and I appreciated it very much. Um, but then a month later, you know, I get this text, and it's just an empty bubble, and that's just a bat signal to see if I'll, I'll respond. You know, again, games. I've done this. I did this. We did this. I know what's up. Um. So to get that song goes off and I was, so then I had, you know, I had Shannon that day. And I, I'm like, Hey, I got something to talk about. Yay. But now every day since I go and I look and again, she appears to be very happy, um, which is cool. You know, she bought a house, she got a new guy, um, you know, uh, on, on Twitter still, um, you know, I, I was upset because, you know, again, it's all subtweets. The, she likes things that are, uh, again, portraying, you know, I, I finally escaped my tiling, toxic, violent, once you realize people love you, all, all this bullshit. And look, I, I also, won't, I'll tell you this, you know, when I was with her, I basically wasn't allowed to meet her family for the first three years. I was told that, you know, oh, fuck this. Again, tell your own, tell your story. I was told they were terrible. I, I was, you know, she told me things about them and this, 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 and, and they weren't good people. And, and, and I was like, oh man. And so I wanted to protect her from that. I wanted to make sure she was okay. One time I was actually standing next to her mother at a, at a, at a baseball game her son was at, and, and she never introduced us. This is when, and the first year that we were out and dating. <clears throat> and I, I never, I should have just been a grown up and said, hi, excuse me. I'm Mike, I'm dating your daughter, but I didn't. Because I'm 47 playing fucking games in 2014 like a dope. But the fact that she unblocked me and I went and looked and, and this was the crusher. This is something. Again, this is I marinate in, in my sadness or my pain or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, like I said, I wasn't basically wasn't allowed. I was told that the family was bad and this, this, this. And then I finally met them at a, at a holiday dinner. And it was great. They were all fantastic. I got along with all of them. Her father, everybody was super nice. And and the whole time she would like when we left, she's like, "Oh my god, I'm really sorry about that." I'm like, "What are you talking about?" She goes, "Oh, just I, I know that must have been torture for you." And I'm like, "I liked meeting everybody. That was cool." Yeah. Oh well, you know, let's get out of here. And like she just, she'd always act like I was being put upon, but I was never. I wasn't put upon. I wanted to meet people. I wanted her. You know, when she wound up hurting her arm in D.C., I, I wanted to call her mom and get her mom over and make sure that everybody was on board and knew it was up. And so anyway, uh, um, the reason I bring this up is because um, her, the new guy, the family loves him and there's photos of them together and <laughs> they spend holidays together and he's hugging the dad and all this. And I just, man, it fucking buried me. I know it shouldn't. I know it shouldn't. That's over. It's past. But it, but it's this thing where you just go, Jesus Christ. I mean, all, all the the stuff that I went through, like, to, and then to see 
and, 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 you know, and she'll tell you this. Look, it's very much he said, she said. She's got her own version of it, too. Uh, and I, I will tell you, a lot of her version is wrong. <laughs> um, so, uh, so every day, man, multiple times a day, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, looking. And also the memories on Facebook, old photos from 2014, 2015, and I'd save them to my phone and keep them and look at them and scroll through them. And, and I can't anymore. You can't. You can't move on if you, if you are in quicksand, and you'll never get out of quicksand if you purposefully jump in it every single fucking day. So... It's interesting that the timing of this Hail Mary and all that stuff was November because November is always hard for me. Um, all you know, there are just dates that are hard. We all have these, you know. It's it's so strange that there are days that are milestones in your life, and then as your life unfolds, it turns out those dates don't mean anything. It's still there. It's still inside you. You you still you'll have a flash of recognition. This happened recently. You know, when I first noticed this sort of phenomenon, it was my father's birthday. I don't you know I don't give a fuck. I mean whatever. But it it gradually just went away until one like I think it was two years ago. It was just December second. And it was this weird thing where I went, today's my dad's birthday. And it just, you know, I had not thought about it in years. I, I just, it's just one of those things that went away. That should be a milestone day. That should be something that means something to you. And for me, it was just December 2nd. August 22nd, 1997. That's the day I got married. March 13th, 1993. That's the day I met Karen. Uh, those are those are hard days, but they're days now. That's all they are. And it's tremendously sad if you think about it. And life moves on and everybody does whatever they're going to do. But at the same time, there's just those moments that when you live them, they think they're going to change everything and be part of you forever. And they are, but the fact that they lose their importance over years and years is just, it's like watching some f fabulous dress just rot on a, on a mannequin. It meant so much the first day, and now it's just there. November's like that for me. November 25th was the day I met my ex in 2011 and was knocked the fuck over the instant I saw her. November 19th, 2013, which is, yeah, two years later, was uh, the first time we consummated our relationship. I'll say it in a nice way. Um, she came out to visit me. It was when I did Wheel of Fortune because she went to Wheel of Fortune with me. And up to that point, you know, I knew that that, that wasn't anything that was going to happen. She was still married and that all these different things. And, and then it just did. And it was, and it wasn't, it wasn't like it just happened. I mean, it was planned. It was special. It was, and it was, it meant so much to me and, and to her, I assume she actually had the date tattooed on her ankle. 11, 19, 13. And so we had two anniversaries in November. And now, 11, 19 was just Tuesday. And 11, 25 is going to be Monday. So I know I'll have something to talk to Shannon about. Uh, 
it's terrible when something that held so much promise just goes away. I know it exploded. I know it took forever. It's just, I guess it's the aftermath. You know, when there's that huge explosion, there's the mushroom cloud and there's destruction and damage. But then a week later, there's just that stillness and everything is still ruined. I guess, I, I guess that's how I would describe this. You're just, you're just in the quiet period. <laughs> you remember the explosion, but you just, there's, now it's just aftermath. So I have to get that out of my life. So on November 19th, symbolically, uh, that was the last chocolate bar. I ate it that day. And uh, I went on my phone and I deleted all 100 photos that I had, that I looked at, that I scrolled through. And I blocked on Instagram and I blocked on Facebook. And like I said, I'd already blocked on Twitter. I can access the account. I'm just, I'm just not going to. And then, you know, that wiped me out for a couple of days. I won't, I'm, I'm, I wish it didn't. I wish I wasn't so fucking fragile, I guess. I, I wish this wasn't, I, I talk to Shannon all the time and I ask her why. I don't, I didn't know why. I should say didn't because I think I figured it out. It's, you know, I talked on the show before that she was essentially like like a high school girlfriend. Like I, I just, I think it's astonishing to me that I was with my ex-wife for 20 years and I don't even know where she lives. Like I don't know anything about her. She blocked me and disappeared. Um... We wound up reconnecting at the end of last year. Did I tell that story on here? <laughs> I actually, I actually talked to Karen for a while. Um, perhaps I'll tell that story another time. Uh, but you know, I I I was never really in danger of losing Karen. I didn't think, and then she was just gone. With my ex, it was this constant thought that she might disappear. And I wasn't sure what to think or what to do. And so I, I changed who I was to try to make sure that she stayed. Like I, I changed everything in, in a bad way. I, I lost. It was funny because it was like she fell in love with me. And then she wanted me to be this different person I felt. And so I did become that person. And then she looked at me. Because I wasn't the same as before. I don't I dudes, I got tied in a fucking pretzel knots. I don't have any fucking clue. I got no answers for you. Um But but she She was the first person I ever cared about cared about more than I cared about myself. That's terrible to say when you were with somebody else for twenty years. But it's true. And I allowed myself to think that this was a forever thing even though I knew I <laughs> I knew fairly quickly into the actual relationship the one that went public when I could tell you guys I I mean I I'm not dumb I could see that stuff was going on and I would just be puzzled by it I'm like what the fuck why why is this happening and, and I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna bore you with it but you know I, I just I have to get it out of my fucking life. And I did. Symbolically, on the day that meant the most to me, in the month that meant so much to me, uh, I, I did whatever I could to put it in the past. I deleted, I blocked, and I, I you know, I... I Again, it's so strange to me. I have not been in a room with this person. I haven't physically seen this person in three years. 
but the thought would still wipe me the fuck out. You know why? Because you also go, well, why is she happy with someone else? Why, why with all of the, the fucking chaos that we went through, how could she? It's all these dumb questions that don't mean anything to anybody. In reality, move on with your fucking life. In reality, you are the one keeping yourself from moving on. In reality, you make these choices. You eat chocolate. You go back to this fucking heroin. You 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 put it into your brains and in your heart and you and you think about what might have been, what was. When instead you should be concentrating on what will be and what is. Make yourself better. Escape from the prison you've made for yourself. Be free. And then, when you finally accomplish the things you need to accomplish, when you've grown, when you become better, then you can unblock her on all the social media and let her see what happened. <laughs> You guys can get me at Mike at MikeSchmidtComedy.com. You guys can be my friend at Facebook.com slash the 40-year-old boy. You guys can follow me at Twitter.com slash the 40-year-old boy. You can be my friend, uh, like I mentioned, at Facebook. I'm on Instagram and Snapchat at Mike40YOB. That's Mike40YOB. Find me there, please. Send me photos and stories. Uh, Ryan Dirks does all the web stuff for the show. He's the coolest. Find him at Facebook.com slash Riot. Oops, hold on. Look at the hiccups there. Facebook.com slash Ryan Dirks. Uh, you go ahead and find him there and tell him he's cool. Why not? That's always a nice thing to do. Particularly during the holiday season. Uh, David Hernandez, David Mex Hernandez, does all of the artwork and the music for this show. You can find him at Facebook.com slash David Mex Hernandez and be his friend there. Check him out. Look around at all of his stuff. You know, while you're there being his friend, you can also take a look at all the artwork that he's done and his photos. He's done a ton of artwork for this show. He's done a ton of artwork for his closed group. That's right. He has a closed group. Now, if you're his friend, uh, you can go ahead and ask him if you can be in this closed group. It's called This Is Dumb, That's Dumb, You're Dumb, I'm Dumb. And it's got uh, Ground Beef Greg and, uh, and fucking Slumpus Bagumpus. All those guys are in there. These are characters that David's created. He's actually painted them. He's made them look fucking amazing. Uh, what is it? A fucking hot tits. Tina, I think is one of the chicks. I don't know. They're all there and they're amazing. Uh, there's a uh, Lil Hitchy, I think might be a character. Go check it out. The point is if you're his friend at facebook.com slash David Max Hernandez, look at all of his artwork and then ask to join the cult. The, this is that, this is dumb. That's dumb. You're dumb. I'm dumb cult. There will be questions for you to answer, but once you answer them, then you'll be so happy and, uh, and then you'll be in the cult and that'll be perfect. And also, you know, the Christmas season is upon us. If you want to hire our friend David to do any artwork for you, like I said, go ahead and peruse the artwork he's got on his website. You can see all the characters and stuff that he's uh, created for his closed group. You can see all the artwork he's done for this show. Also, if you go to the Westside 86 Jokers page, you'll see artwork that he does for the show every week uh, in the form of Jokers and things like that. But man, he's available to do anything you would need. You want him to do artwork for like oil painting or watercolor or any of that stuff. You want him to do Facebook caricatures for you. He can do just that. Go ahead and, uh, and, and send him a note. But first of all, you got to be his friend. Facebook.com slash David Max Hernandez. And uh, hold on. Powering through a yawn. You want to go ahead and write him on there and send him a note and tell him, hey, I need you to do this painting for me. And now, especially if it's an oil painting, you got to get to him quick. Because, I mean, it takes time to dry. Christmas, we're looking at a one-month turnaround now. So, please, you got to definitely get a hold of him quickly if you want him to do some stuff for Christmas. Cool? He's swamped, uh, which is a good thing, as far as I can tell. Um, right? It's good to be swamped, correct? Uh, you also want to go to his website. Because I mentioned all the stuff at Facebook. You'll see all that stuff. But he also did more corporate type of stuff. You can see that at his website, which you can go to and visit right now. That's artbydmh.com. I know you're thinking to yourself, what is that? How would you spell that out? Well, you'd spell it out as A-R-T-B-Y-D-M-H dot com. When you go there, you'll see like his Valscapes and his Gaicons. You'll see all the stuff he's done in the past for uh, the work he's done for advertising agencies. Just amazing work he's done. Professional quality work that he can do for you as well if you want to hire him to do so. And you do. Trust me. I swear. 
Go to artbydmh.com. That is A-R-T-B-Y-D-M-H dot com. Welcome to the Mexicans Rock and Roll Limbo, where the lost souls of rock royalty pay tribute to the 40-year-old boy. Schmidt, he's five years old, into show and tell he strolled. Nobody ever told him it's the wrong way. No, it's not cool, brought a bullet into school. Who you think you're gonna fool? It's the wrong way. He ain't too smart for the school he attends, so he's gonna read porn to his friends. Salty tears running down to my chin, fish bag fell through the ceiling and then it came in. The bad signal, chart from where he sits, just from thinking about some tits, it's the wrong way. Don't know what's up, but he is only a pup, so just wait till he grows up. Instead, and the house. 
smells like Thursday. Accuses caring of ruining the happy memories from yesterday's life. She grabs her keys. She now is leaving. So no turkey. No stuffing and now no wife And the house, it smells like Thursday Suspended from Bolingbrook High School, I had the bright idea and put forth the proposition that I could seek refuge in George Arnold's house. Seek refuge in George Arnold's house. Seek refuge in George Arnold's house. You cannot seek refuge in George Arnold's house! Now I'm hiding in the shower George's mom came home to pee Oh yeah isn't dead, are they? Nah, who cares? I'm rocking the shit out of these drums, dude. Sponsors? Holy Christ, have we got sponsors. Uh, podcast sponsors, certainly. Well, sponsors of a podcast who happens to be podcasts themselves. Look at that. Look at the way uh, symmetry. I like symmetry, don't you? Uh, our good friend Fearful Jesuit who uh, is doing the yeoman's work, taking apart all these conspiracy dickheads on the Paranoid Strain podcast, which is available right now on the iTunes store. Go download it. Go subscribe to it. Go make it a part of your life, a part of your daily life. That's right. Let's do it every goddamn day. Uh, the Paranoid Strain is available right now in the iTunes store. The newest episode or the, the most recent episode is certainly the one about uh, vaccinations. And as I've mentioned before, you can hear all sorts of interesting things on there about early anti-vaxxers. Uh, you can hear about our friend Andy Dubbs. You can hear about leaky gut. Uh, you can hear about all of these horrible things uh, that have been done. You can hear our, our good friend. You can hear about Bob and Fred and the dragon. You can hear about our, our buddy uh, Jesuit who keeps bad mouthing Zeus for some fucking reason. Uh, we hear about uh, the sharpshooter fallacy. All of these things are very important, and I want—I don't want to give them away, but they are available to you right now on the iTunes Store or in the iTunes Store on the uh, the Paranoid Strain Podcast. Which you should download now. Also, you can contact them. Did you know that? Paranoidstrain at gmail.com. Send them a note. Tell them how much you love the show. Tell them how much you loved hearing from it from me, about it from me. <laughs> and uh, so he thinks we're still hitters and he can go ahead and continue to advertise on the show. That would be great. I would love it. 
Uh, Fearful Jesuit is the best. A good friend who always calls and or not calls, at least texts to check on me to make sure I'm not dead. And that's all you need in this world is you need one person to keep checking on if you're dead, if you're dead or not. That's the, the main thing. Have one person who will text you to go, hey, man, you all right? Hey, what's going on over there? And he does it anytime the show's as late as it is this week. I get a note. and He's like, uh, buddy, what's happening, man? And I'm like, hey, I'm here. Uh, I promise I'm not dead. So, uh, again, all you need in this world is one person to check in and make sure you're not dead. And Fearful Jesuit might be that person for me. Yawning sucks. But he's available now at parano- Oops, sorry, ParanoidStrain at gmail.com. Write him there, please. And tell him you love the Paranoid Strain podcast. Tell him you heard about it from us. Leave it a review in the iTunes store. Download the show. Subscribe to it right now. And, uh, and I, you know what? You'll be better for it. That's right. I'm going to say that. I'm going to go ahead and on a limb and tell you that you'll be better for it. Quality, informationally dense podcasting done right in a closet with Dana Unicorn by his side on his lap and an awkward Jesuit knocking on the door wondering when she's going to get her fucking chicken tenders and fish sticks. But it's it's quality podcasting. It's it's number one. It's A number one. It's top of the hill. Ah, shut the fuck up. The Paranoid Strain Podcast available now in the iTunes store. Go get it. It's really good. Uh, also sponsored by our good friend Rob Matsushita and his podcast called The Knife Drop. Uh, in the latest episode, they talked about the movie Walk Hard, uh, which, as you know, features our good friend John C. O'Reilly. John C. Riley, not O'Reilly, John C. Riley. Uh, he interviews Christopher Chen about Asian stereotypes in acting uh, or in casting, I should say. Uh, Big Slim McGroovy is there talking about death at a preschool, which is uh, a non-existent movie that people want to know about. Um, but by the way, Rob also listened to the show and he reached out to me. He's like, Hey, I was thinking of doing a project regarding one of your stories. I'm like, please don't do that because, uh, people listen and they're real. And he's like, yeah, okay. I'll maybe avoid that, <laughs> which is nice of him. Thank you. Um, yawning blows. The knife drop podcast is available new in the iTunes store. Go ahead and leave a review, write him a note, tell him he's the best. Now, you can be you can be his friend on Facebook if you want. As a matter of fact, he's our good friend, Rob Matsushita. You can find him at uh, Facebook.com slash Rob dot Matsushita uh, and find the Knife Drop podcast, which is really good. Something you should check out right now. Download it and go ahead and write him a note and tell him you heard about it from us. And then he'll think we're hitters. And he'll continue to be uh, associated with our show, which makes me very happy, as I've mentioned many times. Hey, man, let's talk about this. I've affiliated myself with SoFi. Do you know what SoFi is? SoFi is a, uh, a money app. Uh, I do. I load a, make a lot of P noises there. Um, here's the, the, the look. I'm not going to explain that. I, I know what it's about. All I know is if you seed your account with a hundred bucks, I get 50 bucks. And then within a week, you'll get 50 bucks. And then you can take your money out. I don't give a fuck if you leave it in there. As a matter of fact, doesn't matter to me. Uh, but it exists. And thank you to all the people who've taken the plunge and trusted me enough to go ahead and do something like this. Now, here again, I, I think I mentioned this last week. Like, I thought that SoFi, you know, again, I don't know who the fuck they are, but I did a bunch of research on them to find out who they were and what they're about and what they're doing. And then it turns out that the new stadium opening in Los Angeles where the fucking Rams and the Chargers are going to play is SoFi Stadium. So, look, man, the, these guys are around at least through next football season. It, they could end run out later. But I'm just asking you to get fucking 100 bucks in there for a week. Put 100 bucks in there for a week. And then you fucking leave it in there and then you get 50 bucks. I get 50 bucks. Then you take it the fuck out. Look at that. It works out. And it's the Christmas season. What a, what a fantastic way to earn 50 bucks for me and for you. So go ahead and be my SoFi person. There's a link. Uh, should I just, Jesus Christ. I wonder if I should just, should I give the link on the air? Oh God, that seems fucking shady, right? Um, do I even know the link? I'm not sure. Hold, hold on. I'm going to try to find out if I know the link. I, I think I do. I think I do. I think I do. Um, boy, oh boy. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what. Right now, the if you go to... Boy, I wonder if I can get it on my phone app. Hold tight. Let me check my phone. <laughs> Jesus. I apologize. This is going very uh, poorly, I should say, for you and for me. Um, hold on. So, Fi, where's the link? There's a... There's a, this is an app. See, this is, don't, just don't listen to this part. Just go ahead and tap dance through it, just like I'm trying to do, because I want to bring you something. Because again, finance is very important to me, as you know. I'm certainly nothing if not a financial guy. Uh, face ID lets me into my phone, spinning a wheel. All right, there's me. Um, invite friends. Okay, where's the link? Do I have a link? Thought I had a link. 
Fuck this. All right, look, go to the Facebook, go to the Facebook page, the Westside 86 Jokers page, and, uh, and you'll see the link right on there. If you click it, you get 50 bucks. I get 50 bucks. Put 100 bucks in the account. And there's a, a bunch of people have already done it. Eh, a bunch, a handful. I think we're at double figures now, which is kind of nice. Um, cause that's going to come in handy because you know what? Fuck. I'm, I'm even with a hail Mary landed, we could all use more money. I could use 50 bucks for a head. So please go ahead and join the SoFi uh, crowd. And again, it takes a week. You get your 50 bucks. You can take all your money out. I don't give a fuck if you close the account at that point, get me my 50, get you your 50. And there we go. There's no fucking time limit on how long you got to keep it in there. That's fine. Uh, so there you go. Uh, <laughs> um, so please go ahead and follow me uh, into SoFi Hell. How about that? Let's put it that way. We'll call it that. Um, MailChimp. I think I mentioned it earlier in the show. Of course I did. Hey Mike, add me at gmail.com. Hey Mike, add me at gmail.com. You'll get on the new newsletter list, which is, again, that's on my, I've got a plans, I've got a list, and get the newsletter up and running is on there, as you heard. So I'm excited to do that. I'm excited to have you come along with me. That'd be great. Um, there you go. Cool. All right. So there's that. SoFi MailChimp. Hey, Twitch, let's talk about this for just a second. You know, I got a Twitch channel. Of course you do. You know that. Well, before I get into it, well, fuck that. I'm telling you this now because a lot of people tune out the plugs, I think. Um, December 20th, which is a Friday, we're doing the 40 year old boy Twitch Christmas party. We did it last year. People are very nice and they buy me gifts. You do not have to. You can just come and watch. That's totally fine. Uh, I wear a Santa hat. We have hot chocolate. There's some cookies. I may have a special guest and I will open gifts from listeners on the air. You can watch me do it on the screen right there on the, on the Twitch channel. Uh, I will do that and you can check it out. It'll be totally fun. Friday, December 20th. And I don't have an official time yet. It'll be sometime in the afternoon. I, I want to do it at a time where everybody's like kind of home from work too, that sort of thing. So I don't want to schedule it too early. Last year, I think we did it at 5 o'clock p.m. And that sounds good, 5 o'clock p.m. Pacific time. But let me double check with uh, if I possibly have a guest and all that other stuff. And then I'll have an official time for you. But Friday, December 20th. And I tell you this now because if you want to get me a gift, uh, and you, you don't have to, but if you want to, you got to get the P.O. box for me and you got to get it in the mail. Because, uh, you know, we're a month out. So I figured, you know, you got a month, a month of a heads up now. So, uh, so go ahead and send that to me or whatever. And if you don't want to send anything, don't, but if you do, that's fantastic. You got to contact me for the PO box. I don't give it out over the air here because then I'll be deluged with fucking ridiculous, uh, junk mail and garbage. So if you want it, please contact me at all the places you can get me at Mike and Mike Schmidt comedy.com. Uh, facebook.com slash the 40 year old boy. F- send me a message on there. You can find me at twitter.com slash the 40 year old boy. Find me to get the PO box and, uh, and then subscribe to the Twitch channel, follow and subscribe to the Twitch channel. That's twitch.tv slash the 40 year old boy, I believe. And, uh, or go to Twitch and just put in the 40 year old boy. You'll find me. You'll follow me. Everybody will be happy. I'll be happy. You'll be happy. It'll be perfect. But December 20th, that's the important day because that's the Christmas party. So if you want to send anything to me, you probably got to get the machinations going. You got to get the, the wheels in motion and send me whatever you can so it gets here before the 20th. Cool? Cool. You're a month out. And you're, you're on the clock. You've been warned. Uber and Lyft exist. My Uber code is DJZW1YTTUE. My Lyft code is Mike720057. That's Uber DJZW1YTTUE. And Lyft is Mike720057. Use those codes if you're a first-time rider. I get a spiff. If you want to drive for Uber or Lyft, use that code to become a driver. And uh, I get a bonus. And that would pretty much help me out in a way that I can't even explain. Yeah, I can. Give me money. There you go. Explained. Cameo's out there. Cameo's a phone app that you can put on your phone and then hire me to say cool things to people you know or to hire me to talk yang to a bunch of people that you know. Who knows? I can let people have it. I can be nice. Look, man, you can mess with the bull and get the horns or you can just get all fucking sweetness and light. Whatever the fuck you want out of me on Cameo, I'm happy to do it. Download it to your phone and have me send a message to one of your significant others, to one of your lovers, to one of your cousins, to one of your aunts. I always bring the aunt up because I, I, you know what? Does it, does it appear that I'm really trying to get a hold of your aunt? And I think it should at this point. Um, or somebody you work with, or anybody, a listener to the show, somebody who doesn't know the show, I can say, you know, just tell me, I'll do a commercial where I'll tell them they got to listen to the fucking show. If you want to explain to somebody why you've been listening to me for 12 fucking years, have me send them a goddamn personalized message, and they'll be like, holy shit, this is the fucking guy you listen to, I got to get on board. Or, holy shit, this is the guy you listen to, I never want to talk to you again. Whatever. Either one is fine with me. So hire me on the Cameo app now, today, today. We got a YouTube channel, as I mentioned on the list, I got plans. 
Plenty of other YouTube stuff coming down the pike. That's uh, youtube.com slash the 40-year-old boy. And also, there's a Patreon page. Patreon. Become a patron of this show. Why wouldn't you? I've got people jumping off like Willard's Rat Army. I think I've lost four people this month. So, hey, there's slots available. If you want to jump in, uh, it would really help me out again in this holiday season. It's nice of you to think of me. Patreon is there. More posts are coming. Any posts are coming. That's the important thing. Uh, go ahead and sign up and join in. That'd be fantastic. I would love it very much. Became a patron at patreon.com slash the 40 year old boy, or is it Mike 40 Y O B? I'm not sure which do me a favor. Just go to Patreon and just Google Patreon, the 40 year old boy. There will be my smiling dimpled face and you can jump in and become a patron. I'd appreciate it very much. Uh, go to Mike Schmidt comedy.com. Again, this is also important with the Christmas season upon us. Go to the merchandise page. And there's an Amazon link, just free floating right there in space, right there on little Schmidt's bedroom wall. Click on that. And then you're shopping and we get credit for it that's right we get money they get money you get stuff it's a perfect relationship you're gonna be shopping at i get a hiccup again fucking hiccups suck um so it's a perfect relationship go to amazon.com look you're shopping there anyway for christmas right this costs you nothing but 10 seconds of finding the link on my page go to mikeschmidtcomedy.com click on the merchandise page and then there's an amazon link click on that and then you're shopping and we get a taste of the gig it's perfect steve lawrence style i'm all wrapped up in lake waza pomani and a goddamn towel with the blues brothers pork pie hats and sweaty sunglasses why don't you fucking buy something and make sure i get credit for it capiche uh, so go to MikeSchmidtComedy.com Click on the merchandise link And then in there you click on the Amazon link And then you're shopping and we get credit And everybody's happy I'm happy Are you happy? We're all fucking happy I'm totally happy My voice is fried It's a little fried out Because I was yelling over the weekend I went to see uh, I went to see fake Van Halen My friends were in town The UN of Evil came to town I went to see fake Van Halen And then I went to see the uh, Chicago Bears Which was Oh that was a lovely game In the Coliseum Wasn't it Wasn't that great To watch Mitch Trubisky Step on his dick Over and fucking over again Because uh, You know Why wouldn't the Bears Fuck up the most important Draft pick they've had In 30 years That's fantastic Go ahead and select This fucking slob It was depressing man We went to the Coliseum And it was just And I'll, I'll You know Maybe I'll tell you more About next week um, But we went to the Coliseum And it was just It was Probably 60, 40 Bears fans. I mean, it was just, it was a, a good crowd and it was a lot of Bears guys, but it just, you know, in the first quarter, the Bears had two takeaways and then they, but they missed two field goals, all momentum out the window. If you listen to the game, if you watched it, it was quiet in the stadium because the Bears fans had nothing to fucking cheer about. It was fucking terrible. It was so bad. Mitch was garbage. Uh, and we, we cheered. We tried to a couple of times. There were sacks or whatever. When they finally scored in the second half, we were into it. There was a ton of fucking Bear fans. We're high-fiving people. We're bumping fists. and and But just we couldn't. It was funny because I will say this. The Ram fans were really nice. Like, I didn't think they would be. Maybe it's because they knew they were outnumbered or whatever the fuck. The only thing they had is they had a cheer. They'd be like, whose house? Ram's house. Whose house? Ram's house. And people would play it was a call and response. So they would do that, but then when they would do it, people would go, Bears house, and then people would be chanting, let's go Bears, and it would drown them the fuck out, man. It was crazy how many Bears fans were there. But these Rams fans, like during the game, there was one obnoxious guy yelling. That's it, one in a stadium of fucking 70,000 people. And then when we left, everybody was crestfallen. Bears fans were so bummed. And Rams fans like could sense it where they were just kind of like, hey, man, that was rough. Hey, are you OK? Like they were they were genuinely reaching out therapist style. Even people with like face tattoos would be like, yeah, that was a tough one. And like, yeah, because they look they look like shit, too. But at least they got the W. But we were leaving the stadium. This is so funny because everybody's like, whose house? Bears house. Whose house? Bears house. And then we're leaving and people are being very nice to us and saying, are you OK? Is everything all right? And yeah, it's fine. You know, we're getting used to it now. This guy's a bum. And uh and and finally this these people we were walking by and they just started going whose house and i just looked at this guy and i went ram's house like just like crestfallen ram's house i mean there, there was nothing else to say i will tell you this when i was leaving the stadium i was walking down you know we stood up and we're walking down the stairs because it was over with the three minutes once they pulled their fucking they pulled the quarterback put in the backup we knew it was finished we watched his last drive and we got the fuck out of there so we're walking down the stairs and people are streaming out and then I'm walking by this totally true. There's a guy in a bear's fucking hat and a bear shirt and he's typing. I can see it on his phone. I see the screen and he types, this bear's offense is pathetic. I can, I can read it right in the screen and he's still typing. So I stop and I tap him on the shoulder. He looks at me and I go, fucking pathetic. 
and he goes, just kind of nods, and he literally goes to his text, he goes backwards and just types, fucking pathetic. And I'm like, yeah, that's the that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a fan base that totally is fucking in sync with one another and is willing to swear at their mom because I told them to. Jesus, it was- Podcast. Podcast. Podcast.